Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and today we have the three amigos. Uh, there's no Amber, there's no Nate. Instead, it is the true three amigos here. We have Cliff Bar Racing and Trainer Road's Pete Morris. How's it going, guys? And we also have our, of course, our head coach, Chad Simmerman. What's up, Chad? Hi, everybody. Hi. Are, are we excited to have like the best podcast ever with us three right now? Yes. Let's make it happen. It's going to be yes, great. Yes, definitely excited. <laughs> <laughs> and with, this is uh, another way to phrase this is this is me with Team Thunder and Honey from Cape Epic. So um, the the team the that Honey sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Easy on that chat. <laughs> it's already going off the rails. Uh, so uh, thanks for listening to the podcast, everybody, and tuning in on YouTube. If you're doing that right now, give us a thumbs up. Drop your comments into the chat. Join the chat. I'm sure you're planning on doing that. It's a ton of fun to have everybody in there. And if you're just listening to this podcast, you can share it with your friends. That's a huge help. And you can head over to trainerroad.com. That's really helpful for us. So you head over there. And you're going to be able to find strength training calculators, plan builder, all that stuff. So you can send your friends that way and they can check out why you are so fast. Of course, uh, don't worry. You think that that's going to make them as fast as you, but everyone will increase together. So don't worry. Rising tide. Uh, okay. With that, just a couple of things before we get into, get into everything now. Uh, speaking about training with your friends, group workouts. If you go over to Nate's Instagram or our Instagram, just follow us at trainer road or Nate is tr.nate on Instagram. He always shares the workouts that he's doing every week. Uh, so he's not here this week and next week he'll be, I think back to the training grind, um, when he returns, but uh, you can join him on his group workouts. You can join your friends on that. It's an awesome feature. You can get faster together. Highly recommend it. Uh, Pete, since you're here, we can talk to you specifically about it since this is the project that you're really at the helm of. How is the iOS beta doing? We're cruising. Um, we have lots of, we have hundreds of people, um, testing out the beta with us right now, which is awesome. Um, we're getting really good feedback. That's always what we want kind of as much feedback as we can get. Um, and again, just lots of rides. We want to make sure everybody's devices work really well. Um, the workout player is exactly what you expect. We snuck in a lot of improvements, so we want to see how you like those and, and, uh, see what you think. So, um, if you want to, if you want to get in on it, um, there's a forum post, uh, with a form that you a Google form you fill out and then we'll add you, we kind of add a, a chunk of people every day, but, um, there's a forum post and, um, yeah, we just want more people, um, give cool. it a shot and tell us what you think. Awesome. Good stuff. Another thing to mention too, is an, an Android will be coming thereafter. Uh, so we are working yep. on that as well. Yeah, um, it's, <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> you, have, you have to take things one step at a time. Uh, exactly. Another thing I want to mention is on the blog. So that's trainerroad.com slash blog, which by the way, our awesome copywriters are constantly posting up fantastic content. It's all focused on making you faster. That's Sean, Jesse, and Megan. They're fantastic. And we don't talk about all the other people behind the scenes, our engineers, our support folks, our designers. Thanks to everybody here at Trainer Road for always putting out awesome stuff. Uh, but uh, with this, that they we just posted a really cool post and shout out to Nathan, one of our marketing marketing product managers and Babs. They really did a lot of work on this and our copywriters. Uh, but it's called the elements of getting faster. And effectively, it's like the periodic table of elements. But we've put them down and basically brainstormed what we, we feel like are key elements in order to get better on the bike. Because there's so many different things that you can do to get better. And there's so many voices that are telling you do this or do that. And many times they even contradict. Uh, there are a lot of different things. So this is a great way to kind of stay focused and to look at it. So if you go to the blog there, you'll be able to see it. You can also find it on the forum. And it's called the elements of getting faster. And there's really four categories within the elements. There's lifestyle, nutrition, training, and recovery. And Babs, our designer, made it actually look like a really cool periodic table of elements, which is awesome. Uh, so uh, within that, there's, uh, like I said, those four categories. And I figure we could just pick our favorite elements from each one of those categories and say why it's, I guess, our favorite or the one that we picked from this. I put down in lifestyle, I put down stress. And the reason it's called stress and it's ST, um, but the reason it's called stress is because, uh, it's one of the points that once again, with a lifestyle, you have to understand the fact that training introduces a ton of stress. So when you have that stress, then you have to go through there and make sure that you're accounting for that. It's really easy to just to think that I should be able to train and life will carry on like normal, or I should be able to do X, Y, and Z, and it shouldn't affect my training, but everything is connected. So that's one that I picked out. Chad, how about you? Uh, I chose learning. So LR, cause it, I don't know. It's, it's pretty straightforward, but I feel like learning should be part of every important endeavor. 
continuously and, and, and they specify that it's learning about strategies and race craft and skills. And those are all hugely important things. And a lot of things that don't necessarily get addressed when you train indoors. So I like that applying a bit of focus to things that have to happen outdoors. Yeah, no doubt you embody that really well. Constant, constant learning. Yeah. I think most of us do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pete, go ahead. Um, I picked habits, uh, because I feel like that's one of the things that people take for granted at the beginning. And I still learn good habits now, 10 years down the road. But if I would have learned my good habits faster when I was getting started, I would have been a lot better, uh, through and through. So, uh, I think creating those good habits as soon as you can and knowing that there's always more on the table, um, is just, it's like cheating. You should just do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> In the nutrition section, both you and I, Pete put high quality. Why'd you select that one? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't leave that one alone. You know, it's sort of on brand for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, sure. But yeah, I think, I think that's, that solves a lot of people's problems with nutrition in one fell swoop. Um, and going for high quality, um, sources of food, uh, just you, you inevitably make better meals with better macronutrient balances with more nutrients that you think about your food more. So to me, that seems like, a it's something you can take out at the knees for your diet. And then you make a huge improvement without doing that much else. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, exactly. And, and I can't say any, at any better than you did. So, uh, Chad, uh, you put down hydration. I did just because it's uh, more personally relatable. I mean, all these things are important and it's easy to choose any of them, but I chose hydration because I think that was probably for the long period of time where my performance was hampered mostly by my lack of uh, hydration strategy. So any, any issues I encountered were probably tied to water loss and, and sodium loss. So, and, and it, since then I've, I've definitely improved it. Haven't really had a chance to test those improvements in, in actual competition fingers crossed that'll happen soon. But, uh, I do feel like there's been big improvement there and mm -hmm. it has shown a light on just how very important hydration is. I mean, outside of the obvious. Yeah, that's been a, <clears throat> these are hopefully what you can do is you can take some notes on what's important to us. Then eventually you can check out what's, what's really good for you, but that one's helped chat a bunch, uh, for training in that category. I put down progressive. Um, I think that that's like an important for me, I've realized in reading all of these coaching questions that we get, we have plenty of people asking, like, can I just jump straight into insert whatever training plan? And usually it's, I want to skip along and just start out somewhere else. And I think that following, a uh, uh, I guess a progressive ramp rate that you're training is intentionally following. If it's like a well-designed plan, like all of ours are you get the sort of fitness that, uh, isn't, it isn't brittle fitness. It's what I would call substantial or, re, you know, resistant fitness where you can rely on that for quite some period of time. Uh, it's very robust and what it makes it, uh, what it ends up doing is making all of the training that you're actually carrying out a whole lot more attainable. Your workouts become less scary and fast forward four weeks in your plan. And you'll be surprised at what you can actually do four weeks ago. You would have never thought you could do those workouts, but because you followed a training plan with proper progressions in place, then you get to the point where, wow, I'm doing way more work than I was ever capable of. It's tempting to jump ahead, but it's always best to take the steps necessary to get to there rather than trying to take one big leap. Uh, Chad, how about you? What'd you put down? Uh, again, this, this category has 10 different cards to choose from and all of them are solid, but I, I leaned on strength because it's particularly applicable today to today's discussion, but also because I believe it's a fundamental uh, underpinning. I mean, it's, it's so necessary and it gets so easily overlooked too often overlooked. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Pete. Um, i kind of, kind of mine goes hand in hand with yours. Uh, I pick structure because with the right structure to your workouts, uh, every workout is exactly as hard as it needs to be. Um, which to me, I've done a lot of intervals in my life that were not the right difficulty level for the time and place I was at and what I was training for. Um, so realizing that the structure is more important than, uh, doing some magical number for X amount of minutes is really, uh, was kind of life changing to me. And that's definitely when I got started getting much faster than I was in the past is when I actually adhered to structure and did what I was supposed to do. And all of a sudden that changed the way I, I was as a cyclist for sure. So that one always hits home because 
if you don't know, you don't know. And then as soon as you start doing it, it's just crazy. One thing with that too, if you aren't following structure, then you're leaving yourself up to, you know, the whims of whatever ends up happening. Like a lot of the time we, we always hope that we want to be super fast or achieve a certain level. But if we look back at our approach to getting there, many times we deviate from structure and we just think, oh, well, if I ride a lot, it'll happen. If I go for these KOMs, a lot, it'll happen. Or if I race a lot, it'll happen rather than adhering to structure and structure is a roadmap, right? Like it's like your directions to get there. It's so important. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, and a lot of the time I see athletes saying, yeah, but I just need some fun or I just need to be able to unplug. And that's totally understandable. However, I found what's really helpful for me is to get my structure out of the way first and then tack on the fun part. And I get to do both things. Like I'm, 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 I'm emotionally satisfied because I did the hard work and because I had a lot of fun and I know that I'm making the steps toward where I need to go. So that usually looks like whether it's doing my workout on the trainer and then going outside and riding or doing outside workouts and I get the workout done first. And then after that, I go ride mountain bikes. Like I did on Strava this weekend, I did a really hard workout. It was, it was eight by four and a half reduced amplitude billets, which that's like, uh, basically 20 seconds on 15 seconds off. And the on, is it like 130%? The off, is it like 90%? And you just repeat that for four and a half minutes, such a hard workout, uh, not happy with Chad that day. Um, but <clears throat> after that it was done, I felt so good that I had accomplished something that hard. I soft pedaled for a while to be able to recover. Then after that, I got in a good couple hours on trails of just enjoying the trails. Like, so you can do both like structure is, does not counteract fun. And that's actually Chad or Pete, what you selected for the final, uh, category, which is recovery. Yeah, I think um, it, we have a real um, kind of mental push to really maximize our recovery. And it, it's been ingrained in us that you put your legs up, you do as little as possible to maximize your recovery. And I think that is uh, kind of shorting yourself in your life and with all the other things you have to do. Um, going on walks, doing regular fun stuff like going to a of an event is all totally fine. And it actually recharges you just as much. I think you may, you may sacrifice a small bit of recovery, but the, in the overall picture, you're going to actually be in a sustainable place with your training. Um, so to me, uh, you just have to still have some fun in your life. Even if you're a diehard, if you're training for something that's really important to you, that's okay. Um, focus a lot of energy on the training, but always focus a little bit of energy on maintaining a fun kind of lifestyle that that agrees with your training. Um, and it also keeps everyone around you happier and all of that, which is, is important in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, Chad, what did you select for the recovery category? Well, it, if we touch back to the training side of things and, and structure, if, if you forego structure, you're basically formatting or, uh, forfeiting control in the whole process, at least a certain level of it. And then we step forward to the recovery side of things and I, I leaned on balance. So I mean, we take the structure, we take the fun that Pete's talking about and you know, we effectively balance that amongst a whole number of other things. But I believe balance in all things is, is absolutely vital. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I put down sleep because it's been the most impactful thing for me. Uh, having gone through, our son is four now, you know, of course, so we don't aren't, aren't dealing with the toddler sleeping or baby sleeping or anything like that. But if I, I, I screw up my sleep plenty and I don't need to blame it on my son. <laughs> so, and I'm sure a lot of us feel this way. We just sit there in our, in, in bed, either working and, and answering emails or doing stuff like that, scrolling through social platforms, uh, doing whatever else we're doing. And so many times we sit there and we realize, oh, wow, I've just cut what could have been eight or nine hours of really good productive sleep down to seven hours, down to six hours. And now I'm not going to be able to get more out of it. I think that if all of us athletes, many times we hit plateaus, if we continued with our training that got us to where we were, but we just started to sleep more and tried to focus on getting higher quality sleep with making sure the room is darker, making sure the room is cooler, making sure that we have everything that we need to be able to sleep well. And we aren't eating too late before dinner, but also aren't starving ourselves too much. That's silly, you know, seemingly silly stuff. If we did all that, I bet that we would see a bump in our in our fitness because it just allows your body to recover so much when you're asleep. So 
Yeah. So anyways, there's a ton more, like Chad said, just in the training section, there are 10 elements. There are four elements in the other categories, four elements in the, per each. So check it out. It's super cool. Uh, the elements of getting faster. And we think that we're probably going to be using that throughout the product in a lot of different creative ways going forward. So it's exciting stuff. Uh, mark down which elements are your favorite, or if you're watching on YouTube right now, go and check that out and let us know in, in the, in the chat, that'll be good stuff or in the comments if you're watching this after the fact. Okay. Just a couple more bit, uh, one more thing, job postings. If you want to come and work with us here at trainer road, which I think all three of us highly recommend it. Uh, we'd love to have solid people fill these positions, uh, for brand designer and video editor. So if any of those, or if either of those two positions pique your interest, head over to trainerroadcom slash jobs and follow through with the whole process. And we'd love to hear from you. Finally, Chad, you sent me a video of a balancing machine, a manualing machine, I should say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you were like pro at this thing. I was shocked. Uh, like <laughs> Chad, like, cause a lot of the time, if you look up a manual balance machine on YouTube, you'll see a lot of people and probably some, some fail videos where people are like kind of strangely holding on and terrified of falling back. And for those that don't know what a manual is, we should probably define that first. Pete, do you want to, do you want to define what a manual is for people? <laughs> Yeah, you um you more or less lean back far enough on your bike that you pull your front wheel off the ground and you find a spot where you have balance with your front wheel off the ground. So your weight is kind of counterpointing your bike pulling up um, yeah. and you just hang out with your front wheel uh, like at 45 degrees or so. Yeah, it's a, it's a wheelie without pedaling, right? Yeah, and you yep. can, yeah. as long as you standing have momentum, as long, yeah, standing, good point. And as long as you have momentum, you can just continue carrying <clears throat> that that wheelie or that manual for as long as you need. So they build mm -hmm. these, like, uh, people build these manualing machines. Can you describe what they're like, Chad? Yeah, this one looks like a, it's just kind of a, a wooden cross laid on the ground with a little support for the wheels. So little brackets to park your, um, and it just turns out that if you do a, a six inch board and you put a couple two by fours on each side, it perfectly brackets about a 2.3 inch mountain bike wheel. Huh. So it holds it in there pretty snugly. So you're, you're not going to fall sideways. And that's the beauty of this whole thing is, is you're supported laterally. So there's, some, there's no possibility of falling sideways. And then you bungee the front wheel so that when you come up, you can't really, uh, what's the term uh, loop out. You can't, mm -hmm. can't kick the bike out, bike out from underneath you. So it, once you trust the, the actual apparatus, it's really liberating. You can really commit to it. Cause you know, there's just not real, real high, high consequences. You're probably not going to blow it. It'd be pretty hard to, so then you can just focus on establishing that balance point, learning how low your body has to be, how far back you have to be over the rear axle, how hard you don't have to pull up to get into that position. And then just kind of sit in that position and feel what it's like to achieve that point of balance. And then I understand we are still laterally supported. We are still bungeed at the front, but I've tried it out on the trail and my confidence is way up and I can already manual for a few seconds at a time. Whereas before I was terrified of even getting the front wheel off the ground and trying to hold it for even a second. That's awesome. Uh, and, and now Chad, it's pretty fun. you're a committed and promised man as a fiance to a fiance. So your motive behind this is for trails, not just to look sick and attract all the awesome people and make them think you're cool. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, that... See the, I mean, learning a manual lends itself to so many things that will benefit you as a rider, especially on the more technical terrain. I mean, just yeah. being able to get that front wheel up shows you where you need to start any bunny hop. And, and that's, that's a big deal. It shows you how to handle a drop where your weight needs to be off of a, a, a shallow to tall drop. I mean, there are so many carryovers between understanding how to find a balance point in a manual to a lot of other techniques you could, you'll utilize on a trail. Lee McCormick from Lee likes bikes right now is just like fist pumping in the air. I'm sure listening to this <laughs> and hearing about us focusing on skills. So, well, let me, let me just tout a couple of resources. If you haven't discovered, uh, Kyle and April's, uh, YouTube channel. This, these guys are amazing. Kyle, Kyle Warner, he's like a pro down, a uh, pro enduro rider, right? Yeah. And he's, yeah. he's got some good results, really personable, explains these things really well. He's like Lee in that respect. I mean, he, he'll, he'll explain something in a way that resonates with, he'll probably explain it three different ways. One of them will click mm -hmm. and it'll make sense. And in, in the process of doing so, he's teaching a relative rookie. His girlfriend, April is his test subject. And yes, she does come from a professional motocross background. Just learned that. So she's got certain things weighing in her favor. But the fact is, she's very relatable because she's a scared. She's, she's afraid of these things that he's trying to talk her into doing, showing her how to gradually inch up the challenge of it. And in a span of like 10 or 15 minutes, each of these will demonstrate really well 
some technique that has probably baffled you up until this point. So he does a really great job of that. And he has both a, a manuals video. And then they also, he just, just him has a video on how to build one of these manual trainers for super cheap. I just happened to do it out of scrap in my backyard because we're, we're perpetually <laughs> Chad is a, got building materials yeah, laying around. Chad is a construction zone. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. And then, uh, and then what about on the manualing side of things? Is there, is there another helpful resource on that? Or does that come from Kyle as well? Uh, it did. Yeah. yeah. He has a manuals video, a bunny hop video. Uh, uh, he's she's, uh, there's probably 30 of them and I've watched all of them. I almost cool. don't, don't want to disclose this as a resource because I picked up so much from the guy, but <laughs> he, he, he deserves to be recognized. He and his, and his girlfriend, they're top notch videos. Cool. Awesome. That's great. I love shining light on, on creators that are content creators like that, that are honest, not incentivized, anything else like that. That's great. So mm -hmm. cool. I want to build one of these things. Cause when I saw Chad do that, I was like, Oh, Chad's so cool. Like as soon yeah, as full I saw disclosure, that, <laughs> I, I had the materials, so I just had to fish them out of a pile, but it took me about 45 minutes. And there were a couple of mistakes along the way that I had to unscrew, rescrew. So honestly, I think you could build one of these if you're pretty handy well under an hour, just about anybody. Oh, it's very straightforward. Awesome. That's, that's cool. Okay. Let's get into a question. <clears throat> this will, first of all, actually that, that elevates thunder and honey. If anybody's wondering right now on the Epic, uh, <laughs> Cape Epic team stuff, Chad can manual. So he actually is going to win everything yeah. just cause manual, like a manual, on a manual trainer. We'll, we'll see how that carries. <laughs> it's just, it's so cool. And I want to be able to do it. Um, okay. End does question. He says, what is the relation of the somatotypes to a training plan, eating and recovery? I bet Enda has been getting the same Instagram ads that I get nonstop, which are always uh, some gym bro yelling at me, telling me I'm doing everything wrong because I need to match my body type with my with my with my training. Uh, but this is an interesting concept because we're talking about endurance sports. So uh, wondering about the relationship between that. He says, an example of my case, I'm an ectomorph. And for those that are wondering, you can Google somatotypes and you can see, but there's ectomorph, mesomorph, and then there's endomorph, those three different body types. And in many cases, like, you know, people talk about the, the endomorph being the big stocky oh, person. Oh, don't just, get too I, ahead of us. I, okay. I'm going to explain all this in great detail. Okay, cool. I'll let Chad get into that then. <laughs> Back to the question. He says, I'm an ectomorph and even training VO2 max or sweet spot repeats, averaging about 400, and he mentions Strava TSS. So that's not actual TSS. It's just an estimated value from them. He says, I still look like I've been playing video games all this time for what it is worth. My riding buddies have calves larger than my thighs. He mentions that he's 182 centimeters tall, so very tall person now. It says, I hear this body type is good for endurance, but how if there's less about how, if there's less room for glucose to being stored? So I assume that the assumption there is the fact that if you have more muscles, you have more room to be able to store glucose. It says, I also read, and he mentions bro science here. He says the ectomorphs will need to invest more time in heavy weight exercises in the gym. Does this translate into more VO2 to max repeats and less base training? Does this also mean the FTP is doomed to remain lowish for the rest of my life? Your podcast and the holistic approach to life and training combined is super motivating. And thanks for what you do. Cool. And, uh, um, we appreciate this. This is actually a really interesting, uh, uh, question to have because it implies a few things. If indeed those assumptions are true, it would imply that based off of our body types, we would need to train very differently. Right, Chad. That's kind of the assumption mm -hmm. here. Yeah, that's, that's an implication. Probably mm -hmm. the implication. So first off, thanks, Andy. It's a great question. Uh, we were struggling. We needed one more, and this one got thrown in at the last minute. I'm really glad it did because it was mm -hmm. fun to research. And it was fun to not necessarily tear down, but to shine a light on how this is another perceived limitation. Um, so firstly, the question I would want to ask you if this question were posed to me in person is, how do you perform relative to these riding buddies you're comparing yourself to? Because if it's an aesthetic concern, that's one thing. If it's a performance concern, that's another thing. I mean, if you're already kind of spanking them why do you care what your body looks like however maybe you just care what your body looks like i get that too i think they're both valid concerns and it just so happens there's a fair amount of overlap between them and, and both of them are going to get addressed here but do understand that looking like a cyclist and performing like a cyclist aren't always in line you can look the part and be a poor rider you can not look the part and be a fantastic rider so. I, even if one one observational point on this the the tour that we just watched which was absolutely mind-blowingly great uh so great this year but how different does primos roglic look like or look compared to chris Froome, compared to garrett thomas compared to brad mm -hmm. wiggins even compared to tadej pogacar right like very mm -hmm. different looking athletes 
Yeah, I've got some some particular examples that I'll also shine a light on. It's mm -hmm. it's pretty fascinating. Okay, so let's let's discuss somatotypes real quick because that's the term <clears throat> that you threw at us, and Owen, I, and I know it's a term most of us have heard. Basically, it translates to body types. So if you hear somatotype, just just it's body type. It's that simple. Back in the 1940s, a man by the name of W. H. Sheldon. I believe coined these terms and, and defined three different body types, three different somatotypes. So as Jonathan started to talk about, there's an endomorph, which is in his terminology back in the forties is round and soft versus a mesomorph, which is square and muscular versus an ectomorph, which is thin or fine bone. And these were rudimentary descriptions. And this was a time when, you know, this was, this was new based on you know, little technology, little science, I'm guessing. Flash forward 50 years, 1990, we, ha we now have the Heath-Carter method and, and they get a bit more scientific about it and they assign numeric ratings and, and we can mix the, the three types into various subtypes. But basically they describe somatotype as, quote, the quantification of the present, my emphasis, shape and composition of the human body. And that's important, the present, because well, we'll, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. So under their definition, endomorphy is relative fatness Mesomorphy is relative musculoskeletal robustness and ectomorphy is relative linearity or slenderness. So most commonly I see these terms applied to body composition and applied to how difficult or easy it is to gain or lose body mass, whether it's muscle or fat. And in the case of the ectomorphs, the long lean folk, they have little muscle or, you know, if you, if you conform to this understanding or this description, little fat, little muscle, these are the hard gainers. The endomorphs are kind of the opposite end of that spectrum. They have lots of fat, lots of muscle. They gain easily. Unfortunately, it tends to be fat that's gained easily, not so much the muscle. And then in between, you have the mesomorphs, which are basically the Goldilocks. They're not overweight. They're not underweight. They gain and shed weight easily, whether it's muscle or fat. And then on top of this, uh, this, this uh, more developed explanation of these body types, we have all these combinations. You can be an ectomorphic endomorph, an endomorphic ectomorph, a mesomorphic endomorph. And what we commonly see with cyclists is a, is a mesomorphic ectomorph. So the trunk is muscular and robust. The upper body is typically, well, wafy if we're honest, but, but <laughs> linear and slender, if we're, if we're kinder. <laughs> so, the, so, so that's, that's basically what somatotypes are. And, and there is a hand, actually there's a fair amount of research on somatotype influence performance whether or not it's telling or they prove the point that they're trying to prove is, is questionable, but there's in some interesting stuff out there. So let me just tell you about a few studies that I came across. One is Helen Ryan Stewart at the University of Winchester, 2018 study. She linked anaerobic performance to, 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 to body type. And specifically they looked at bench squat and a wind gate. So it is cycling applicable because they do do a 30, 30 second all out sprint and found that at least partially, so roughly one third of this anaerobic performance was predicted by body type. They use physically active males, didn't look at women. Um, these were physically active to begin with. So, you know, there's a bit of bias incorporated into that. The, the second study was Chiwachi in the British Journal of Sports Medicine 2005, where this, uh, these scientists or, or researchers linked benefits of aerobic training to somatotype. And what they found was that the, the mesoecto out improved other body types in most measures of aerobic fitness. So again, we're effectively talking about <clears throat> about cyclists. So there was a link between body type and adaptations, aerobic adaptations specifically. McLean and Parker, 2007, they looked at elite Australian track cyclists. No surprises here. They found that the sprinters had a mesomorphic or mesomorphic build. That's it's understandable. And the more ectomorphic builds tend to be the riders, or, or I should say the more endurance oriented riders tend to have more ectomorphic builds. Mm. Foley, another British journal of sports medicine, uh, he and colleagues in 2017 looked at, they, they basically classified cyclists into four groups, sprint, pursuit, road, or time trial based on their relative strengths. And they found similar findings. The sprinters tended to be more mesomorphic or more mesomorphic athletes were better sprinters and thus became sprinters. This is, this is the argument, right? Mm. Time trialists were more ectomorphic. And then the road cyclists and the pursuit riders were somewhere in between, as you might expect. No surprises there. But again, it's a, it's a chicken or the egg yeah. question. And then, and then finally, and this one I found really interesting and most specific to, to what we're doing and very specific to mountain biking, was Munoz, probably Munoz and Muros, <clears throat> excuse me, from the University of Granada. 
2017, they basically described the anthropometric profile of world and Olympic level cross country mountain bike champions. Mm -hmm. So they've actually looked at a, a pretty wide cross section of elite XCO riders. They had 51 riders ranging all the way from national or elite level riders, all the way up to not just Olympic and world riders, but champions in the Olympics or at the world level. And what they found was the top of the top of the heap, not much surprise here, lowest body mass index, um, lowest body fat percentage, larger, more muscular thighs, low endomorphic, high ectomorphic components with a mean somatotype. So they all kind of came down to, again, drum roll, ectomorphic mesomorph. So the, so the same people we're talking about, stocky lower body, more, more wavy upper body. They also found that the Olympic and the world champs specifically had, and this was interesting, higher weight, both muscle and fat, bigger arm girth, not, not, not a big surprise there, whether flexed or relaxed, bigger arms, bigger calves, bigger total arm muscle, they, they were beefier relative to road cyclists. And, and this, I mean, you, you can pretty easily pin down courses got tougher. Courses are more technical. The, the riders have to be able to do more with their bikes. It's not just about enduring. It's about being a rather physical athlete in a rather physical sport. Hmm. This so, is, that, <laughs> one, one quick thing on that. A good example of this is Nino Scherter. And then if you look at Julian Absalon, perfect his, example. the one that preceded him, right? Nino looks like a relative rugby player compared to somebody mm -hmm. like, like Julian Absalon, but Julian Absalon even probably looks like, you know, a, a, a weightlifter compared to Chris Froome. And, and right. it's, it's all, and it, but that's, that would be fascinating to see how that's distributed across the different sports like that too. Well, well it, it's as though that the, the courses and the changes in the, in the courses that XCO riders face these days actually dictate body types, not mm -hmm. the other way around. Right. I mean, it, it could definitely be argued. Hmm. So that the point I guess there would be that so many aspects are shapeable and we can shape them through, through so many different methods. I mean, obviously diet, the activity levels, our lifestyle, some of them are not something we can influence. We're not going to be able to change bone, bone length and width, bone girth, um, the distance between bone features. That's pretty much etched in stone, but behavior is ultimately in charge of this whole situation. So, so, so much of our body type is shapeable and yes, to varying degrees, but we can exert influence over all of these things. So take diet for instance, and there are, there are many ways. And I came up with one little example. Say you have a pint of Ben and Jerry's every day, and then you <laughs> do your hit workout an hour later and you do that five days a week versus the same rider who decides I'm going to have a pint of Ben and Jerry's Monday through Friday, but I'm going to save all my work for the weekend and I'm going to, get a, going to go ride five hours on the weekend. You're going to get a different body type as a result of that approach, simply because you timed the same nutrients, uh, the same amount of sugar at different times relative to your workout. And then when we look at exercise, so many aspects of exercise itself, uh, compare aerobic endurance work, 60% of FTP versus high intensity interval training versus strength training versus concurrent training, which where we try to basically be the best at everything all at once. There are really <laughs> important e ecological considerations. I mean, consider someone living in the Rift Valley. You're in Africa, you run to school every day, five kilometers. You run home at lunch, five kilometers. You run back to school. You run home at the end of the day. You are probably going to have a different body type than a typical kid who goes to school and sits at a desk all day and then comes home and parks behind an Xbox for the remaining hours of the day. Mm -hmm. Then throw altitude into it. You know, one athlete does all these or one of these kids does all this at elevation, the other kid does it at sea level. I mean, these are all influences that are, you know, to some extent within our control. So if you recall the whole genotype versus phenotype, this applies to body type too. I mean, our genetics say we can be certain things, but our behavior says which of those things we're going to trigger. How are we going to express that, that genetic code? Hmm. And, and also recall that higher, a higher level of competition necessitates or, or pushes us toward a greater importance of somatotype. So, so, I mean, it's common to see similar body types among top level athletes. You look at top level sprinters versus top level road climbers versus top level mountain bikers. And you get the impression that you have to have a body that looks like that in order to be that good at those things. And to some extent that's true, but it's not entirely true. And like Jonathan talked about, there are so many examples. We can look at the NBA and you'll get Muggsy Bogues, brothers five, three. I mean, he is, he's not a big player and he's not there because he's the token short guy. He's there because he's damn good. Mm -hmm. Look at Spud Webb back in my, more my era, he was five, six and five, six isn't, isn't, you know, in general, a short person, but you put him on a basketball court, that's a short guy. Mm -hmm. 
look at Usain Bolt. Who, who would have predicted a guy who is six foot five would be arguably the fastest man we have ever seen? That's a tall man with very long levers who can turn them over ridiculously fast. Obviously, he's got a long stride. Mm. Then let's get a, more, a little more specific to our realm and look at Max Valscheid. So, so the tour just finished. He's an NTT sprinter. He is six foot six, 203 pounds. Oh my he, gosh. I, I think he's the biggest rider in the pro peloton. And if he's not, he, he has to be amongst the top three. So that, that translates, by the way, to 199 centimeters, 92 kilograms. So he's a big guy. And what did he do? But not only finish the Tour de France, and, and, and one that people have said his, is the hardest in the history of the Tour de France for, I mean, so many different challenges got thrown at these guys. Mm. Not only did he cart that big frame up and over those climbs and made time cuts day after day after day, but then he gets to the Champs-Élysées, the, 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 how do they put it, the world championships of sprinting, basically, mm -hmm. and finishes 10th. 10th behind the best sprinters in the world. And he's, he's huge. And then look, look at Peter Sagan. Look at Wout Van Aert. Look at Amber from Trainer Road. Mm -hmm. All these people defy their body types. They excel at things that if you look at them, you wouldn't think they'd be good at. And mm -hmm. then to turn it back to, to Lothar Later, or to a triathlon and to date myself, Lothar Later, 1997, he was the first guy to do a sub eight, uh, uh, sub eight hour Ironman, 6'2, 170 pounds. I mean, at that size, he had to clock somewhere in the ballpark of a 230 marathon at the end of an Ironman. I mean, that's, that's Insane. crazy impressive. And, and like, like them, most of us in most ways are not defined by somatotype. Something interesting with this, another good example of this is Bradley Wiggins. If you look at Bradley Wiggins prior to yeah. becoming a GC contender, his body was not the, he was not the frail, very like, I guess really we'd talk to, I think what ectomorph or and no more for yeah, really, very ectomorphic. Yeah, very thin and frail. He, his frame was extremely narrow, right? And he was same uh, with Grant then, Thomas. Yeah, Grant Thomas. And then once he won the Tour de France, and then he started to focus. And when he became TT World Champ, his body changed once again. He was he was a different, you know, he, he was different. It's it's like the the nature versus nurture sort of thing, right, Chad? And and mm -hmm. nurture has a huge, huge component and you can change a lot of Massive. what you can do, but in the end, your body type, is it fair to say it doesn't define your, your, your basically your performance potential? That's certainly my view. And, and I think most people would, would abide that view. I mean, if we, we can, we can turn it back to more, more endurance relevant implica implications mm. and, and look at it from the perspective of, there are some truths to this. I mean, hard gainers, you know, ectomorphs can indeed struggle to add mass. Emphasis on can, because they can do it. Easy gainers can indeed struggle to say light, but they can do it. It's within their control to a large extent. Um, limb, limb lengths can indeed influence things like maximal cadence or, or max force production. So if you think of sprinting and explosivity, yeah, shorter legs do have to move less, but that's more really a matter of fiber composition. So long legs can do it too. Turning over large gears. Yes, longer levers, longer legs seem to be a benefit, but it's really tied to the length of the muscle fascicle and the penation angles and things that we don't consider and we cannot see with the naked eye. And it's true, however, that, that these gains and losses, these things are true, but gains and losses are again within our control. Mm -hmm. So gaining muscle and losing fat, there's almost always a way. There's, there's really no position you can, no corner you can paint yourself into as an endurance athlete where you can't influence those two things. Mm -hmm. And then it's also worth recognizing that the trade-off between having more muscle mass, which you know is, is interpreted or measured as greater cross-sectional area, comes at the expense of your oxidative capacity. I mean, these things work in balance with one another. And, and when one goes up, the other has to come down and, and vice versa. It's not, it's not quite as black and white at that, as that, but the fact is bigger muscle fibers aren't as oxidatively capable. Mm. They're, they're, they face limitations as they get larger. So again, ask yourself, does my performance merit this focus? Do I really want bigger muscles? Is it going to make me a faster rider or is it just going to make me look better and feel better about myself, which itself is, is a valid argument. Mm -hmm. So does my more, does my performance merit this focus? If you answered yes, recognize you can change it. You can change your body type again to varying, varying degrees. So don't let it decide your fate because that, that's just another form of pigeonholing, self pigeonholing, which we've talked about in the past. I'm not a good climber. I'm not a good sprinter. Well, not with that attitude, you're not. And, and not without changing certain things, you won't be. 
recognize too that training shapes your body over the short term it's really easy to see it's really easy to get behind but long-term adaptations are hugely important and and keep in mind that behavioral change takes time to really settle into a dietary modification that you want to adopt and abide from that point forward which is the only way you're actually going to change your body permanently takes time and i'm not just talking weeks and months i'm talking years in a lot of cases mm -hmm. i remember when i was coached way back um a, a very bright guy had us on a body composition or body adaptation. I can't remember what he termed it that took place over three seasons. He was already looking at amateur riders over the course of the next three years. He wanted this to come about gradually. He wanted it to be something that they were going to be able to maintain. So body type does shift and change. And I know I'm going to sound like a broken record, but if you want to change it, there are a couple key things, intensity being one of them and the other being strength training. They absolutely have to have places in your workout regimen. And to your question specifically, building muscle on the bike, it's a fool's errand. I mean, we're asking nature to do two distinctly different things. We're telling it, I want you to build up big muscle fibers that can do work. And I also want you to build up big mitochondria that use energy. So one of those things is distinctly anabolic. The other is distinctly catabolic. And you may not think it, but mitochondrial biogenesis is distinctly catabolic. That's a method increases in mitochondria. See to it that we can utilize more energy. That is the essence of catabolism, but there is a middle ground. Stay tuned. We're going to talk about that <laughs> toward the end of this podcast. And then finally, and to, to address your question of glycogen storage, yes, less muscle mass does mean less storage capacity, but your glycogen storage capacity is still trainable. And secondly, same question is your performance in fact affected? Are you doing events where your lack of bigger muscles and bigger glycogen storage and the extra work that comes with, you know, carting around <laughs> extra muscles and that extra glycogen. Is it relevant? Are you doing 90 minute crits where it really doesn't matter? Are you doing uh, Leadville where it definitely does matter, but could be addressed in, in different ways? Ask yourself, is this actually something that's limiting your performance? Mm. Pete, you've, uh, you don't look like the typical cyclist, like in, and you, I know from your time when you were focusing on CrossFit and everything else, you can get jacked, you can look really big and you can do that pretty quick. How have you managed that? Like trying to basically, you have your kind of your natural, the cards that you're dealt. And then mm -hmm. did you ever go through times where you were trying to be the wafy, as Chad said, mm -hmm. the wafy cyclist body type? And, and when did was, you- yeah, too. Uh, yeah, Chad was too, yeah. Yeah, I remember Chad when he was wafy actually. Um, compared, <laughs> yeah, who are we talking about, me or now. Pete? Because we're both in the same You're boat You're both here. in the same boat, actually. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, but Pete, take it away, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I bet Chad can, Chad can chime in on this too, but um, kind of in your natural homeostasis, it's easy to get um, kind of a little bit in either direction. Like it's pretty easy for me to gain 10 pounds or to lose 10 pounds if I'm kind of in a happy medium. Um, so, as I get further and further away, it gets more difficult and more work, just like everything else, right? Kind of as you push the boundaries, it, it, it gets harder. Um, so I've raced bikes at high levels, both at 177 or 176 pounds and at 210 pounds. Um, mm -hmm. I had my most power PRs at 210 pounds, if that makes any sense, uh, <laughs> because obviously. Um, and I could go uphill pretty well not well enough at 176 pounds. And for me, it seems like the happiest and fastest I am is closer to that 185, 190, 195, depending on how, what my body composition is like. And, and um, it always depends on what you do, like what I am training and if I'm mountain biking a bunch and you know, what is putting muscle on my body? Um, because since I do gain a little bit easier, if I mountain bike two or three days a week, my upper body, uh, grows to fit, I guess you could say. Um, so I bet, I bet Chad's experienced the kind of the same thing where there's a happy place for you and where that is, uh, it's, it's based on what your body is, but it's more like your body set out some parameters and then it's up to you to find the, the right place in those parameters. So that, does that sound true, Chad? That's, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. I think that's perfect. You described your range as as a pretty wide one mine was too is all the way down to 167 up to about 192 maybe even as high as 195 at times so wow. again a big range so we have the benefit of being highly shapeable and and what that's a product of i don't know maybe because we've been doing this so long maybe maybe we have certain genetic predispositions it doesn't doesn't really matter it is what it is but i have recognized that 
I'm, I'm happiest in life and performing best on the bike, you know, that balance we mentioned earlier when I'm riding between that range, right in the middle of it, everything mm. seems to gel quite well. One thing that I'd like to hammer home with this really important point is just because you look like a certain type of athlete or what you think a certain type of athlete should look like, doesn't mean that you have to be that type of athlete. There are athletes like what Chad was mentioning when we're talking about, you know, high level sprinters that are in the tour de France that are really big athletes, Max Valscheid, he doesn't look like a sprinter, really tall athlete, really big athlete, but still doesn't look like a sprinter. Like he and Caleb Ewan, you couldn't pick two further ends of the spectrum, right? Between those two. But the fact is, especially those of us that aren't paid to race, we can kind of be whatever we want. So it's, it's up to you. And, and don't let your body type define who you are. It doesn't have to define how you train either. Like uh, all of this melts away when you have a very clear path forward on how to train for whatever event you have or whatever goal you have. Then train the energy systems that are going to be used on that day. Make sure that you're nourishing yourself sufficiently. Make sure that you're you know trying to strike balance like we talked about earlier. If you're hitting those marks and you're going for a specific goal with a specific plan, then you're going to get there. And you'll, you'll, you'll be the best version of yourself there. So there's never any reason for us just to, to block our, our, ourselves out of possibilities just because of appearance and what somebody else says. Uh, that's the fun part about not being a professional cyclist. You get to pick whatever you want to be. So, yeah, I, I want to echo one thing John said that I think is super important is if you train the best way you can in the given duration of time for your goal event, your body will look the right way. It will look as it's supposed to over that time. It'll grow to be the right shape and what it is and perform the right way over that time. You couldn't do anything better or different. I mean, maybe you could have, but with what the work you did, the time you had in your goal event, you will be the shape that you should be by the time you get there. And it's not worth gray hairs when you weigh one pound more on a Tuesday than you did on Monday. And, you know, it's beating yourself up over the, the long term, which is really, really hard on you. Just trust that if you do the work, and you fuel and you have a plan, you will be the right shape, the best shape you could have been by the time you get there. And that's the shape it is. It doesn't matter what. And that shape may not look like what you thought it was going to look like or what somebody else thinks it's, it looks like. Maybe different. That doesn't mean that you can't perform yep. at that level. I've seen, I've had times like this year when Pete was climbing so extremely well and you didn't look like Contador, believe it or not. A crazy, right? Pete didn't look like him. <laughs> so, but it's, it's, that's just how it works. Uh, specific training brings about a specific result and that's what we should go for. Uh, Rob's question. And by the way, if you're joining us on YouTube and you see the jerky video, um, I, I think that we may have had some connection issues here. So uh, bear with us while that happens, but it sounds like the audio is still preserved. We may end up disabling our videos if something gets really bad here, but we'll continue the podcast and carry on with it. So regardless, those that are listening, they probably really don't care what I'm talking about right now. So I'll just get into Rob's question. <laughs> he says from Australia and so looking forward to spring and summer to utilize outdoor workouts. Yeah, it's a ton of fun. Um, I've been been, it's funny. I've been, I got my indoor training space so dialed in now. It's amazing. And I think I prefer doing my workouts inside now because it's so great, but I've been forcing myself to do outside workouts recently because we finally have clean air, no smoke. And I figure, Hey, in January, I'll really be excited that I, you know, spent as much time as I could outside with that. Um, but I don't deviate from structure. That's the key. Just like Rob. Okay. So Rob says, I love crit racing. And at 44, I have a man crush on Pete. I've watched a lot of the USA crits and TR race analysis videos. Will's training on trainer road. It's so inspiring and informative. That's awesome. Uh, way to go. And by the way, producer Tucker, uh, since Chad just toggled his video, we probably changed some things on your end. So producer Tucker gets to put in overtime for the next like 10 minutes or so. Um, so he says, I didn't toggle it. I got kicked off. Right, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, Chad's back. Okay. So he says, whilst my FTP is not high at 3.1 Watts per kilogram. Hey, that's, that's high. Um, the 3.1 is, is, is nothing to be ashamed of at all. He says, I have a pretty reasonable kick. My max is around 1200 Watts, I think. And I have won a few club races using last lap attacks recently. However, I love a breakaway. And he says, my other man crushes Thomas again. <laughs> and I like to make races, particularly at a club level, interesting rather than just riding lap after lap for 30 minutes, then sprinting. This is such a good point, right, Chad? Like you've mentioned this too, plenty of times with like local races or races where you're not really racing for any, anything that's really consequential. Why not make them fun? 
you're not really racing, if you ask my opinion. And, and <laughs> I, I'm not going to be subtle about this. If if you want to sit in a race and wait for the final sprint and hide the whole time, you're in a bike race, but you're not racing your bike. So do you want to be a bike racer or do you want to do bike races? Because there is a distinction. Mm -hmm. And people who hide the whole time, I do understand. Sometimes you get out there and you realize, I don't have the fitness of my closest competitors right now. I have to, I have to hide today. And sometimes you're just, just not on your game. So you hide. But if that is your tried and true approach, I question why you want to race bikes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, it, it can, it, it, on race day, a big day, a consequential day, it's smart to race like that. But once no, again, there's a difference between yeah. smart racing and hiding. There's definitely, definitely yeah. A difference. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So he says, how after, however, because once again, this is a man who really wants to do breakaways. He says, however, after getting an initial gap, I struggle to maintain a high level of power. He mentions 110 to 120% of FTP beyond a few minutes. This level is needed to stay away from the bunch, which most weeks seems content to just ride as a bunch, work together to pull it back any breaks, and then sprint at the end. Once brought back to the field, I also struggle to attack again. My repeatability is not great. So any suggestions on areas of focus to improve that repeatability and to maintain high levels of power? I'm currently working through a plan using Plan Builder to get myself ready for a summer of crit season. Way to go. He says, I love the podcast and everything about Trainer Road. So a couple things, I do see a limitation of, of, and Chad, I know that you're going to get into this too, but I do see a limitation and you, you can't ride at 120% forever, especially if you're doing any sort of a really long attack. And then you go into something like that. Don't put undue pressure on yourself for that. And we'll, we'll talk about that more, but this sort of fitness where we're talking about the ability to have a really hard effort. And then thereafter you can ride at a, a, a high percentage of your threshold for a period of time or to be able to attack and then go back in and then attack again. In other words, repeatability, that sort of fitness comes around with the crit plan. And from what it sounds like in this case, Rob, you're working your way toward that. So I wouldn't put undue pressure on yourself once again, to be able to do things that you're not training for yet. That's a really important thing. Like, you know, sometimes you think, man, I just really suck at repeatability. Well, are you working on it? If you're working on it, then maybe you should be concerned. If you're not working on it, then you shouldn't be concerned because it's nothing that's actually getting, you know, trying to, we're not moving the needle in that way. And one thing with this too, repeatability takes very specific training. It is really hard too. It is very unpleasant. It's very difficult. Uh, the intervals have to out of necessity feel like, man, I can't do more, or I really don't want to do that again. And you have to do it again. Cause that's how you stretch repeatability. That's how you get better with it. And a lot of people say like, well, it just doesn't come around for me. I, that's race fitness. And it comes around once I start racing and you can't train for that. And I'm doing this in air quotes. And I think that that is a bunch of malarkey. That is not true. I think that you absolutely can train for it. And in many cases, you can actually train yourself better for it with structured training rather than just leaving yourself up to the whims of a race to hopefully develop that sort of fitness. Now, granted, it comes along when you force yourself into these race scenarios where you attack and get counterattacks, so you have to respond again, or you're in a breakaway, so you have to repeatedly push those hard efforts. But with specific training, you can get extreme improvements with that. And that's what I do when I follow the cyclocross or cross-country Olympic plan. You follow those plans, you build repeatability, and it's hard. But holy cow, you get to be a thorn in everybody's side with that sort of fitness. You may not be able to, you know, pull off a really long bomb quite as well as you would if you were focusing on sustained work, but that sort of structured training absolutely pays off to make you a repeatability beast when you're out on the course. So once again, if you're not training it, don't expect it to happen. And then number two with repeatability, yes, you can develop that with racing, but you'll develop it later on, Rob, with this crit plan. I promise you, you'll get plenty of it and it'll hurt quite a lot. Chad, do you want to, I want to add, Pete, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I wanted to add one thing is kind of embracing once you get into the repeatability kind of workouts, you learn to embrace what that feels like and that the real deterioration of both your motivation and your legs. Um, but what that also does is at the same time, when you're in a race after doing those or after doing a block of those or a whole, like a whole phase, like the crit training plan, all of a sudden races don't feel like they go on and off like they used to. You're mm -hmm. like, this is all pretty easy. I can't wait to attack. And then when you're coming back, it makes it easier to attack again because you've already put yourself in this dark place and 
you've come back and made your way through. So it changes, the repeatability changes as you get more of it. It changes the shape of the race and the way you're thinking about things and the way things feel. So at, and at the beginning of the season, races always feel terrible. And then over time, they get better and better and better. So you get to grow into it over the course of the season. And um, yeah, it's it changes the way you mentally approach things by doing the really hard work with the repeatable mm -hmm. efforts. Yeah, it scales your expectations. And it also sees to it that the performance is where it needs to be, the specific type of performance. Mm -hmm. So I got to say, before I launch into my, my offering here, is this is probably the single most exciting topic for me to discuss. Um, I, I love breakaway riding and I love breakaway riding in the context of lap races or criteriums. Um, the Thomas, Thomas again, don't get me wrong. It's as impressive as can be. And to get away and stay away, super impressive, but he's got to do it one time. To, I mean, he could, he could get it right on the first time. It doesn't usually happen that way in a criterium In a criterium. It's, it's, it's what we're going to talk about right now. So rather than, uh, distill this all the way down to the physiology, let's just, just let's just talk about the performance goings on when you're riding aggressively, that, that is the word, in other words, racing. So in my humble opinion, I, I believe that the best crit racers combine two things, aggressiveness and intelligence. It, it really comes down to that. If you've got both those things working in your favor, obviously fitness has to be part of this. Fitness has to be part of all of bike racing if you wanna, if you wanna perform well. So we're just gonna take that as a given. But on top of that, the best crit racers, aggressiveness and intelligence. And then when it comes to, to attacking uh, probably an already fast moving field, because it's not moving, if it's not moving fast, you're not getting in the way. It, it, it boils down to riding sub threshold, performing a high VO2 max effort, oftentimes one that's kicked off with a fully anaerobic sprint like effort, and then settling back into something that's close to threshold. Mm -hmm. So th there's, there's a lot of components. There's a lot of moving, moving parts there. First, you have to look at the effort level leading into your attack, because that will absolutely affect the potency of your attack. If revving up for that, you're not positioned well, if you're in the wind, if you're just for whatever reason doing too much work, your oxygen uptake is already too high. You're effectively gonna go in hot and the outcome becomes really uncertain really rapidly. Most likely you're gonna be forced to back off earlier than you wanted to. You're just gonna blow up or you're gonna dangle encouragingly out in front of the field. <laughs> you're gonna be that carrot that brings up the riders who rode a little more smartly. Mm. Um, on top of this, your muscles could already be kind of low on, on go juice, right? You could have done a lot of work leading up to that attack and therefore, again, tone down the potency of, of your attack. Mm. Um, it, yeah. And there, there's, there's these strategies that, that, that I wonder you hear about people who, who dangle out in front because they want to see, you know, they want to see how their legs feel. They wanted to see who was, who was sharp that day, who was going to come with them. That's some nonsense. Every time someone attacks, they're attacking with the intention of getting away. The only time they reframe that is, is when it comes back. Say, I just, I just want to see how everyone else was feeling. The <laughs> fact is they got out there and they realized I did one of these things wrong. And I got out there and you guys either brought me back or I realized I was going to get brought back. So I called it off. Mm -hmm. So a bit of a side note, but one, one exception, it, possible exception with that, Chad, could be, sure. maybe, and this is probably me just lying to myself right now, but if you're <laughs> in a race situation and you don't know who the main players are, sometimes an early move or Fair. something like that is kind of like dangling a line out to see who will bite or who is planning on bite or, or abiding or who has any sort of eagerness. That's but, true. That's true. I look, at, I look at a lot of this through the lens of knowing the riders I'm up against. But if you don't, yeah. that, that is a viable strategy. Yeah. I, I, that said, though, if it sticks, you know you're going to commit to that, right? So it's not like it was just that. There's like a very close contingency, like the plan There's B is in hope. hand. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. So, so really it comes down to, and again, as I see it, shelter, patience, and strategy. I mean, you have to, you have to do the minimal amount of work leading into it. You have to be patient and, and, and just, you know, not, not, not jump the gun, not be too, too antsy and, and do too much work beforehand. And then you have to always have, have proper strategy. And this is what leads to potent authoritative attacks. Mm -hmm. Every attack you, that you fling out there, you have to make it seem as though it's going to work. Have to, it has to be a bit intimidating. It has to show capability. So 
if, if you're wasting yourself leading up to that attack and you fling out kind of a half-hearted attack, whether your heart's completely in it or not, if it appears half-hearted, it's probably coming back. And it's not mm -hmm. the sort of thing that the real strong riders, anyone who is playing their cards well, is going to jump across to. They're going to recognize it as, oh, another one of this. This guy's been doing so much work and now he's going to get 10 feet up the road and wait for one of us to go with him and, and, and follow something that's going nowhere. So you have to make it look legit. It has to be legit. And also that doesn't necessarily mean, Pete, you do a really good job of this. Like, so when somebody like does a flailing sprint of an attack and they're rolling away from the group, I almost like don't put a lot of confidence in that just because I'm like, they're going a little too hard. Like, <laughs> like they're going to explode, right? But Pete does a really good thing of always attacking with momentum. And when you come by like Pete with your speed differential, it's truly discouraging. And that's actually what you need for an attack to stick, not for it to be more powerful, not for it to be faster, just to be discouraging. That's like what you need, right, Pete? Yeah. And I, Chad has it exactly right. Like all of these, uh, kind of check marks as you're leading through are great things to think about while you're deciding whether you should attack or not. Um, and I think the potent part of the attack is the, is what Chad, Chad is saying where you have to be able to get the, the speed differential really, because the speed differential equals the gap over time. Um, and a potent attack, if the field is going really slow, it doesn't take as much work from your end, assuming you attack in the right place. Um, but just because you can attack doesn't mean you should, you should always time it to get the greatest speed differential, um, with what you, what the courses that you're working with and the people riding the front and everything like that. So it's kind of all about like cracking the whip or the hammer blow or whatever you want to call it. But the less work you can do going into your attack, the more likely your attack to be success or it's more likely that your attack will be successful. Right. Because, yeah, exactly. um, if you're, if you're kind of getting throttled on the windy side for a half a lap and then, but you made it to the front, so you might as well attack. That's, uh, no, wait till the next lap, get on the other side no. and do do it again. Um, just because you made it to the front doesn't mean you have to attack. Um, it's, it's the attacking is a totally different game and thinking about when to attack and how you're attacking the field. It changes the way you think about racing a, a huge amount. Um, and if you want to be an off the front racer, um, you think about the field differently than, uh, Chad's <laughs> friends who are waiting for the sprint. <laughs> 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 Sorry, yeah. Chad, we, we hiding, interrupted Hiding from racing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we interrupted you. We'll, we'll let you jump back into where you were. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Chad. No, you didn't interrupt at all. Interject whenever. It's, cool. This is a conversation. Um, so, let's, so let's look more specifically at the, at the attack itself. And it, it's straightforward, but it, it, maybe what isn't straightforward is that there's so much trial and error that has gone into the success that, that some riders can actually achieve when it comes to attacking. I promise you, they didn't start doing this and making it work, Rob. They didn't just attack and, oh man, this is easy. It will never be easy. And they will have failure after failure after failure relative to every time they actually get it a little bit right. So lots of repetition. So with the attack itself, how hard you attack, how long you sustain that attack is definitely gonna affect the sustained effort level that follows. So that has to be a, a primary point of concern. You go too hard, it's going to eat into that sustained pace. You're, you're blowing off, burning off too much of your anaerobic work capacity, which means that when you do settle in somewhere below FTP, it's probably going to have to be a little lower than you would have liked. And your sustained or make it stick pace comes down. And when it comes down, it's the same thing as just hanging out 15 meters in front of the field. It's too tempting. Mm. Secondly, you go to, or the opposite end of that is if you go too soft, you're, you're not going to get a workable gap. That, that's, that's exactly what I was just talking about. And then again, let me say trial and error. Do, do it again, do it in training, do it in racing, but you have to have to practice it and you have to learn what it feels like. You can't rely on in-race metrics. You can't look at your power meter and say, I know I can do a 20 second attack at 470 watts or 740 watts or whatever it may be. And as long as I hold it for those 30 seconds, I can then settle in at 95% of my threshold. I've got this all worked out. I'm going to be systematic and scientific about this. That is not going to fly. You have to learn what this feels like and you have to adapt in the moment all the time. So try to carry that plan into attack. See how that goes for you. I mean, I think we all know the numerous <laughs> sayings yeah. on that matter. Yeah. And, then, and then finally, the, the sustained effort level that you can hold after your attack decays with repetition. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So you can be the writer who attacks, 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 attacks. But if each time you're really behind that attack, expect that every follow-up sustained effort is probably going to be weakened by, by everything you've done prior to that. So again, you don't have limitless, limitless amount of matches. You have to make your attacks meaningful, mm -hmm. which is, is just furthers my argument behind the idea that when people get out there and get reeled back in, they, they were just testing their legs or testing the composition of the group. That's, that's again, nonsense. There's a really good point to this. So um, I was just thinking about, and I don't know if uh, producer Tucker has this up uh, by chance, but I was just thinking about a workout that I did on Saturday, and it's called Hawks Bill Plus Three, and it has 56 attacks in it effectively. And so it's <laughs> like, think of a crit that you've done, because it's, it's eight, four and a half minute intervals, and each one of them has seven efforts where you go up to 130%, and then you drop down to just below threshold for just a bit for, you know, 15 seconds then back up so 56 attacks imagine a race that you're in that has 56 attacks i've been in those sort of criteriums it's a lot of work right but this doesn't mean that just because you, so actually first of all that will give you a huge amount of confidence when you get to the point in your training plan when you can do those sort of workouts you should be like i have a lot of arrows in that quiver like i i'm i'm well prepared but that does not mean that you go and shoot all those arrows that's a key point to make um, uh, Tucker, thanks for showing that by the way, um, uh, on the live stream, if you can see it right now, you can check it out. One of the reasons to join us on YouTube. Um, but, but cutting back to the conversation here, if, if you can, it, it basically, it, when you have 56 attacks that you can throw in that race and you're confident that you can settle in, if you throw those out, you will be weak at the end. Instead, you should look at it as, well, I can withstand 56 attacks from, or 55 attacks from somebody else. And I can put in the 56th. Or I can put in that one 57. that really, yeah, 57th, <laughs> the one that really makes the difference. Like I can put up with everything else and I can ride intelligently and that will allow me to be in the right position to really make an attack that sticks. And that's how you should look at it. You don't prepare yourself in this regard to be able to just attack nonstop. There's some races where that can be helpful, but in more, you're probably not going to win the race that way. You're much more likely to win that race if you're able to put up with and withstand all of the attacks from everybody else intelligently and then just launch the right one. Right, Pete? Yeah. And I think there's a, it's, it's, there's two sides of attacking. There's how stretched the elastic is of the field and timing your attack to go along with that elastic because the more, the more everybody is on the line or on the rivet, um, the less people will be able to respond. And there's the kind of the, the suck back where everybody groups back together and the field actually slows down. So if you can time your attack when the elastic is already as stretched as possible, like if everything's strung out, you're in the right position, you've made it to the front, you haven't been doing work, um, your gap actually enhances with no work from you because the field, the front of the field kind of retracts back into the amoeba of the, the field. Mm -hmm. So you just got an extra 25 or 50 feet or a couple seconds with no extra work on your end. Um, one of the problems is to get the elastic stretched, someone has to be doing something, right? Mm -hmm. so there's, it doesn't stretch out for no reason. If everybody's hanging out, especially in Rob's 30 minute race, um, if people aren't making it exciting, they're gonna be able to chase down anything in 30 for the 30 minute race. Mm -hmm. So you do have to, um, either encourage other people, do some of it yourself. I'm all about, if I got dropped because I attacked the race so much, that's a good day for me, you know, whatever. It, it's way more fun. So um, you can get, you can be part of the, the actions that make the race hard enough for your later attack to stick, but you don't have to be the driving force behind every single one. What you wanna do is nudge it along and put in little bits of effort here and there to make sure the race stays hard and to keep people kind of strung out and um, on the rivet. And then at the end, you do your real attacks or you always wait for the elastic to be stretched no matter what to do your real attack. Um, not always, there's never an always solution, yeah. but you know what I mean? Um, there's a better time and place to attack and that's based on how the elastic looks in your field. Um, and that's always going to make the power required to attack slightly less. So in turn, um, makes your sustainable pace higher. And then all you have to do is go the same speed as the field or mm. slightly lower. If you're, if you've got 10 seconds, you can lose that time over the next five laps or three laps or whatever. Um, and so you can actually go even slightly slower than the field, but getting the gap and then making sure you have enough energy to still stay away 
is a way different um, it's a way different place to get to in a race than just everybody can fire off a 15 second attack. I guarantee it. Mm -hmm. It's being able to still pedal when you get there is the real, it's mm -hmm. the hard part. Yeah. One of the things yeah. that you've mentioned plenty of times, Pete is the, in terms of maintaining that gap, it's just about going as fast of, or slightly faster than the group. You don't want to be going way faster than the group necessarily. It's just enough to be able to slowly and steadily extend that gap. And in this case, you know, with, with a group that just keeps chasing everything down in most cases, that means because you have a lot of horsepower in that race, relatively speaking for the sort of horsepower you're able to dole out, like you're, you know, and one rider isn't going to be able to make that difference. So that, you know, in a lot of ways that you can change this is by developing a relationship with the athletes that where you all can kind of like agree and say, Hey, let's change up the strategy of this race you know, or grab three or four other racers and be like, Hey, why don't we try to one, two punch this thing and let's see what happens. Or why don't we try to do some breaks uh, do that sort of thing, uh, form alliances and, and flip the, flip the chessboard over and see what you can do when, when the pieces are a bit scrambled, right? It makes racing a ton of fun. Pete and I do that with our mm -hmm. local crits. Sometimes Pete's like, uh, Pete's like, Hey, I'm going to go for a long bomber. I'm going to go right from the gun today. Or Pete will say like, I feel like I want to go toward the end of the race or vice versa. And as a result, we'll, will try to play things intentionally differently and it makes it a ton of fun. So, uh, Peter's question, he says, trainer roads. Awesome. Thank you. What is the best way to adjust training in extreme periods of life stress? Kind of like what we were talking about earlier with the elements of training. He says, sometimes I can't mentally cope with intense work workouts, but I still want to be on the bike and maintain as much fitness as possible. Is it better to lower intensity by 10% to make everything achievable or switch to longer endurance rides or just do recovery rides? life stress can take over a week or sometimes for over a month for me to be able to get over it. So, uh, one, one thing that I think about with this is usually Thursdays, uh, these podcasts incur a whole lot of mental stress. And I have tried to tell myself many times, Oh, it's fine. You're that, that won't have an impact on your training, but I've learned. And as a result, what I do is I schedule my easier workouts on Thursdays because I know that, you know, your mind has to really stay focused during structured work. It's really hard on the mind in particular and the mind, at least for me, I feel like the mind is what tells me to quit. Um, it perceives and amplifies those signals from the body and simply can't handle them and ends up turning off. So I try to plan ahead with it. And that's the biggest success that I've had. Peter is rather than looking at like the stress and being like, oh, I can get through it or I'll react once it arrives, anything like that. I try to plan ahead, but in terms of like, which approach is, is best as far as, you know, making it, whether you're just lowering intensity, doing an easier version of the workout or doing a recovery workout, what would you say, Chad, to, to that sort of stuff? Yes. Frankly, it, <laughs> he, he asks, is it better to do any of these three things? And all of them are good suggestions. They all have their, their time and place. Mm. Uh, the 10% the reduction is, is a good place to draw the line. Too many workouts change past the, the, the objective shift if you change them more than 10%. It's not always a hard 10%. You can't put a hard number on it, but I think 10% is a good cutoff. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to do 120% repeats and 110 is doable, but below that is not, eh, it's probably better to postpone that workout. If you need to do sweet spot repeats at 90% and you can't really, you're, you're struggling anywhere below 80, eh, it's probably time to shift the emphasis and do something else. Mm -hmm. um, the endurance swaps is also a great idea <clears throat> as long as the fatigue that you get from the endurance ride. I mean, if you're trying to match TSS, for instance, won't push you off track. So, so you're already tired. So you decide I'm going to do an endurance ride instead, but you do a bigger endurance ride and you actually accumulate more fatigue when you were trying to do exactly the opposite that can derail training progress. So make sure the endurance swap is one that puts you in a better place than, than you came into the workout. Mm. And then the, the recovery rides are always an option. I mean, always it doesn't matter what your schedule says. If you recognize you need a recovery day, if just nothing's happening, even the endurance work is too hard, do a recovery ride. And maybe take, maybe be off the bike entirely, but those recovery rides maintain your training schedule. They allow a little bit of decompression. You're on the bike. You don't really have, I mean, yeah, you can think, but at least you're on the bike, you're doing something. If you're outdoors, maybe, you know, it, it is that perfect distraction that you need and it, it checks the box. You know, you feel like I did my workout today. Yeah. I couldn't do that workout, but I did a workout today. So I'm still on track. Mm. 
And then like Jonathan said, cognitive strain is, is more powerful than most of us give credit. And there is so much fun and interesting research out there where they'll, they'll subject subjects to a particular cognitive strain and then measure their physical capacity on the day. And man, does he eat, in, eat into it. It's crazy. And we've <laughs> talked about this a lot. I mean, go back and come the podcast archives and look for Amber's podcast. She, she expands on this numerous times and really well. It's a big deal, a very big deal. And then finally, Peter, longer term, this may mean, because you talk about sometimes it can take over a week, sometimes a month. At that point, or when you, when you start to dive into those consecutive weeks, you probably need to rearrange your training schedule. Start to, you know, start to pull things out. Maybe I can't do two days of intensity each week. Maybe it's just going to be one day of intensity and I'm, I'm either going to skip that other ride or do a recovery ride endurance, whatever, but start to rearrange your training schedule until you find something that's amenable to your current level of stress mm -hmm. and maybe take events off the calendar because times of high stress, when you're still working toward that very important a event or B event or whatever it is, but it's on the calendar and you feel obligated to bring your best performance to it and you force yourself to train, even though you're flying in the face of everything you're trying to achieve with your training, take the event off the calendar, just, just, just cut it loose and, and be kind to yourself for a period of time until you get back on track. Mm. Yeah. One good point to think of with this too, is if you struggle through, you may be able to like struggle through and just cut through and make it pretty ugly, but get through the workout at 100% or whatever it might be, or even that's at minus 10% if it really costs everything, but keep in mind the potential impact that it has on the next workout that you have to do, right? Uh, it may be a better choice to, to pick that recovery workout instead or, or do whatever other modification. How about you, Pete? I mean, a high stress job, you have a lot of like, when, you know, talk about the balls that you're juggling with work, there's a lot of different things going on. We're talking about app development, like this sort of stuff. How do you manage it? Um, I've done a couple different things. I'm probably 50, 50 on just instantly opting for a recovery day. Um, and like 30 minutes is totally fine. 30 minutes is better than nothing. That's kind of what I always tell myself. And so I apply the same thing for the workout. If it's, if I have a 60 or 90 minute workout, if I make it through the first interval and I want to pull the plug, Hey, I did one, one set, you know, it's better than nothing or it's not nothing as we always say. <laughs> um, and, uh, so I don't, I try not to stress myself out by not performing on the day. Um, and that's pretty helpful. But one of the things that I've had to do is I'm more taxed at the end of the day. My brain always feels a little more cooked. And when my brain's cooked, I, my motivation is pretty low. So I've done, I've been doing more strength stuff this past month and I do it at 11 o'clock because I can still motivate myself at 11 o'clock pretty well. Um, so I just take my lunch and, and do it then. And it's a nice break. It kind of refreshes me for the day. Um, and definitely during, during the summer, I was doing some rides during lunch and I know not everybody has that, that luxury, but that worked a lot better It probably up to my, my success rate on workouts by 50% just by swapping the time of day that I was doing them. Mm -hmm. And I've tried in the morning in the past and that's pretty hard for me too. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a morning worker outer. My, my motivation is so, <laughs> so low at 6am. So, <laughs> so I've had to push and figure it out. And, um, but I, I always just try to get 30 minutes, even if it's just pedaling, um, it's okay. And I'll make it up over time. Hopefully my next workout will be better and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, the timing thing changed a lot for me. If I, if I, like, I'm, I'm a little stressed right now with, uh, the new, the new app coming out and 11 o'clock is the only thing that saves me because if I wait till four, I'm never, I, I'm like, zero for 10 right now. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you have to be realistic so with yourself knows. Yeah, and it costs, yeah. pr and it costs pride too, right? Like, like mm -hmm. you have to admit the fact that you aren't, uh, something that something unrealistic that you build yourself up to be perhaps like the fact is we all need to be realistic with our abilities and our time and, and our, uh, uh you know, our energy and motivation, everything else. It's not going to be perfect every time. And that's okay. Uh, is if you're honest with yourself beforehand and you plan accordingly, it makes life a whole lot easier. And then it allows you to basically take the steps up and surprise yourself when you're able to, rather than, you know, and those moments come around and you do have more time or do you have more energy, you're just able to squeak by still. So yeah, I'd recommend it. Uh, Bevan's question. Let's get into that one. <clears throat> then we'll get into some rapid fire ones. Then one more. We're going to try to, and then we'll get into some live questions. Okay. So Bevan's question. 
He says, hi, Trainer Road folks. First of all, thanks so much for creating such a powerful training tool, insightful podcast series, and virtual community of dedicated athletes, five stars all around. Our pleasure, Bevan. Thanks a bunch for all of that, uh, all that praise and for also trusting us with your training. He says, a little background to preface my question. I'm primarily a triathlete and have been following structured training for about four years and joined Trainer Road about a year ago. Over the past year, I acquired a kicker direct drive smart trainer, which was my first foray into riding with power. A big shift from training solely based on RPE and or heart rate, but it's been limited to indoor rides since, of course, it is a trainer. More recently, I began riding with Asioma. Those are made by Favero, uh, but Favero Asioma Duo pe Power Pedals, and have enjoyed the challenge of structured power-based workouts outside with your outside workouts. One issue I've encountered right away is my inability to put out consistent power on downhills. This wasn't a big surprise since I have traditionally struggled to keep up with others on downhills but I've always chalked it up as a general disadvantage of being a smaller rider rather than a skill that could be acquired if I worked on it. For reference, I'm five foot four inches and about 55 kilograms. So this is a small athlete, right? So my question is, what can I do to improve my power output and consistency when riding on variable terrain outdoors, but specifically on downhills? Thanks again. I appreciate any tips, tricks, or advice. So there's, there's physics we can't get around, right? Like, they just exist. And the fact is, if you're a bigger rider, you have more mass, it's going down at an angle, and it's going to carry more energy and hold on to that energy for a little bit longer as well. Uh, when you get down to the flats, it's just how it works. Like I, if Pete and I tuck at the top of a hill, I am never going to be faster than Pete, right? That's just, that's just the way science works. So it, there's, there's one side of things where you can look at this and we are going to get into like actionable ways that you can improve in this regard. But I think probably the most effective way to look at this is to look at it in terms of you have a certain amount of kilojoules you can expend over that race. And it would be a shame to really put in a lot of effort expending kilojoules in a spot where science dictates you just will be at a disadvantage. And you kind of want to look at it as I want to be able to expend kilojoules where I can have the most advantage, where I can actually play things into my favor and I can get the biggest differential on the field, something like that. So I, I understand that, you know, you want to improve in this regard and their chances are there's ways that you can, but it also, this is a great example of many times picking out like a, a, a limiter, uh, but it's something that you actually can't really budge in terms of the rules of science. You can't ever make yourself something you're not. Um, so I guess with that qualifying thing in there, what would you say Pete on being able to hold steady power on descents? Cause that's kind of a different thing than just outright speed, right? Yeah, that's, there's, um, kind of like that high RPM, high power, high speed stuff is really difficult for a lot of people. And you just don't spend that much time doing it. Um, so of course it's going to feel foreign and, uh, it's something you can practice just like everything else. And actually on a kicker, you can, you can shift into a big high gear and kind of get some feeling like that. And, um, it'll, it'll help, but definitely doing it outside and, and practicing putting power on the downhill and kind of steady power just like you say where it's real easy to surge up and surge down because you're at those high rpms and you're at high power so um it's it's just practice just like everything else um but at the same time that's not the most advantageous way to expend your kilojoules on a downhill so even though that is good to practice i wouldn't um put that as your go-to descent um power output uh, especially for a smaller rider, you want to get as much speed as quickly as you can. So you're going to put out a lot of power at the top and then hopefully catch on, or, you know, even like if John pedals as hard as he can over the top gets on my, in my draft, I'm still going to drop John on most downhills. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter how much power he puts out. So thinking about if John could actually get in front of me by five seconds on the top of the descent, and then I come past him, he's going to be closer to me by the time we get to the bottom which is actually less work overall for John than, um, <laughs> than yeah. the consistent power and getting dropped from my draft. So there's a lot of times where five or 10 or 20 seconds of extra power for a smaller rider over the top and to get up to speed faster than the bigger rider is going to make you closer overall at the bottom of the hill. So, um, it's, it's good to practice the, the consistent power, but start, figuring out a way to really pop over the top and get up to speed faster than everybody else. And hopefully actually have a gap on the bigger riders because they'll catch, they'll catch up and they'll pass you, but you'll be closer overall. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it's kind of two, two things you have to practice, I guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, Chad, what would, do you have anything to add on this one? Yeah, and I'm just going to view it <clears throat> from a training maximization perspective. So relative to your workouts, you know, we're not talking race strategy here or hanging in there with, with riders who fall down the hill faster than you do, rather trying to make your workouts what they're supposed to be. It's one of two things. You either have to find suitable terrain. So look at your workout, look at where you plan to ride. If you can't replicate the demands of that workout on that course, don't use that course, stay inside. That's the other alternative. Anytime mm -hmm. a workout has to be a particular thing and you can't make it happen outdoors, don't go outdoors, stay inside. I know it's a bummer. Sometimes you just want to do these rides outside, but some workouts are better suited to the indoors. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And you can't break that. And like, like Pete said, in those situations, if you're really training for it, then it's that you really want to train in the gear that you'll be using. Right. So tiny cog, big chain ring, and that's what you hold on to. And it really comes down to, to inertia in that case. And when you have more inertia, it basically changes where you dole out force and torque throughout that pedal stroke when you're pedaling on the bike. Now, this doesn't mean that this justifies any sort of, you know, deep dive into your pedal stroke analysis and trying to improve it in that regard. I guarantee you, you'll do a really bad job at that. It's always funny if you're ever pedaling and then like if you've ever pedaled with something that's graphing your torque and everything else, and you can try to do things, but it never actually ends up in the result that you think. Like we're not perfect machines. It, so I'm not talking about that. Instead, what I'm talking about is just familiar, familiarizing yourself with pedaling with high inertia. Like Pete said, it takes time to get used to it and it's tough. And if you aren't used to it, it's going to be harder, but I cannot, I like, once again, strengths, weaknesses, and limiters, three different things, right? Your strengths are your strengths, understand them and know when to use them. Your weaknesses and limiters are differentiated by what actually holds you back from performing as you should on race day. That's a limiter versus a weakness. And there are plenty of ways that you can work around that and you can work around your weaknesses and you can smooth out those limiters. And that concept of accelerating first and getting up to speed is extremely important. And then finally get arrow. Uh, this is like, uh, for that's one thing that I've really focused on because I race with a lot of bigger athletes. It seems like compared to me and uh, against an athlete like Pete, that's one of the only things I can do. And actually there's, if you go into our YouTube channel, there is, it's called the UNR criterium. It was a college campus criterium that Pete and I did, I think last year. And when we were doing that, Pete and I were able to roll away from people on a descent. And I think the reason that we were able to roll away from it is Pete is, is relatively very aerodynamic for his size. It's many times size and aerodynamics don't actually work out very well just because you cut a bigger hole, but Pete is aerodynamic for his size, weighs a lot. And then I think I'm really aerodynamic, but it's just, you know, I have no data to back that up. But as a result, Pete, you and I were able to roll away from the field on that descent repeatedly. And that was helpful, but I had to accelerate beforehand and put in a dig at the top in order to not get passed by you or in order to not lose your wheel. So really good tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's get into some rapid fire questions, uh, from Riley best tour ever. Why or why not? Ooh, Chad, you go first. Kicking this too. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hands down. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't, I don't even think they had TV coverage or they may have, but I didn't have access to it back in 1989 when Le Mans and Fignon did what they did, but mm -hmm. there's no way it was as, as, as exciting as this tour. Every single stage on this tour had something to offer. <laughs> there wasn't a boring day. It was yeah. absolutely incredible. It was hugely unpredictable because we didn't know what sort of fitness anyone was bringing to the table. There was nothing to hint at that leading up to this. So every day was a, a big surprise the the performers the failures i mean it was just constantly interesting and then the outcome no one would have anticipated that there's not one person alive yep. who, who, who would have thought that's what would have happened including the racers themselves yes including pogacar yeah he had no clue i i'm no. sure he was like i i'm sure he hoped to win but i'm sure he didn't know that he was going to perform like that on that day i don't know but i i feel like part of it was because it wasn't a polarized event where you have the flats and the flat ones and then the big 100%. mountain climbs. Instead, if you look at it, the days actually had more climbing in many cases in the big mountain days because they just had so many climbs throughout, but it was like one day classics courses for three weeks. It was mm -hmm. so yeah. good. I loved and it. And there was no yeah. dominant team, no clearly dominant team. I mean, you look at Yumbo Visma coming into it and you think these guys are going to walk away with this. They're going to make Ineos look like rookies. And even they couldn't do it with, with their crazy talented composition. 
Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would say just like John said, every day was like watching a classic for me. Like I could have watched the last 150 K of every day, more or less. Um, yeah. but I did, this was a bad tour for me because I fantasied it. We all, I guess we all did. Right. <laughs> yes. did. And that made yes. us, that made it so much worse. I never want to do that again. Now yeah. I dislike writers <laughs> because you know, I didn't know, I didn't know the, the fantasy thing that sits on your shoulder. So I'm not going to do oh, that yeah. again. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to watch it and enjoy it. But no, this was awesome. It was easily just like Chad said, every single day, you didn't know what was going to happen. And it was a surprise and interesting. Oh, it was so good. Yeah. It's like Pino's back is hurting him and he's struggling through the tour. Meanwhile, he has half the world screaming at him through to their television and Twitter because they're ruining his fantasy team. And it's like, <laughs> we should all take a step back. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, I thought it was awesome. And I hope that there are more races like that. To be honest, I usually watch very few stages of a tour. And just because of the fact that so many of the stages tend to just be a written script and it's, you wait for the sprint or even on the big mountain mm -hmm. days in a lot of cases, it's just like, yeah, okay, well, we'll tune in in the last few K when actually something happens, you know? So, and it was so great. One thing I, I cannot recommend enough is if you have access to the NBC sports gold subscription or whatever subscription you have that broadcasts the full races go back and watch the first 50, 60, even a hundred K of some of these stages, which is crazy. It was nonstop attacks, almost every single stage, like a breakaway was so hard fought for. And that's honestly the racing that is much more representative of what all of us do in the sense that it was like chaotic, not a whole lot of organization crazy attacks and seeing what would stick. And I learned a ton from that, much more so than I learned from what it's like to have an entire team working for me versus another entire team. I'm never in that scenario, but I'm totally in this scenario where a bunch of us are just, you know, knuckleheads trying to break away from a group and seeing if anything works. So it was super exciting. Yeah. Uh, Neil, he says, thanks for your time. Do oval chain rings affect power readings on your power meter? Looking to get a power meter, but I ride oval rings. Thanks from Neil. Uh, I think I'll, I'll have all of us ran oval rings. I have, and Chad has. Yeah, I have too. It inflated my power data. Yeah, I, I, would I, say, I didn't notice a difference and I switched back and forth quite a lot. Yeah. I would say it's definitely apples to apple. It's a, an easy way is to think if you run oval rings, your oval ring power is your oval ring power and mm -hmm. your round power is your Fair. round power. And yeah. uh, even though they could be similar, it, I wouldn't count on it. Yeah. And there, and, and there probably is a difference, but in, in my back and forth, I. I worked hard every time and I got faster over the course of it. So I didn't spend too much time dwelling on it. Yep. And I've never, the only justification that I can have in terms of, wow, this does make a difference. If you have a bike that has significant pedal bob, a mountain bike, then oval rings, sometimes depending on how they're clocked, like the position of the oval, they can like absolute black is a good one for this. They can help like, and I'm thinking of like single pivot designs that are kind of like bobby when they're wide open. If you have a chain ring that's an oval on there, sometimes that can even out the chain torque that you have, like the tension on that chain, or I should not chain torque, but chain tension. And then that can help your suspension stay a little bit more level and help you kind of gain almost like a, it feels like you have more anti-squat. And then that can improve traction a bit too, but it, yeah, I haven't noticed any difference in terms of, wow, I'm really improving at a faster rate now that I have oval or now that I have round and not oval. So I run round now, it's fine. I don't know. Uh, I think that there's a much ado about nothing with that one a bit. Okay. Last rapid fire one from Barnaby says, what's the difference between a warm up workout and an opener workout? Both do the same thing for me, practically speaking. And I noticed one of your warm up workouts, para is used by plan builder at times as an opener. What would you say, Chad, on that one? <clears throat> well, the obvious difference is that a warm up directly precedes a race and an opener. <laughs> typically a day before. So <laughs> thanks. Jerry. I mean, I'm not trying to be too literal here. I'm trying to be rapid fire. Uh, and then, it, and then it, let's not, since this is rapid fire, let's not dive into physiology or anything, but I see uh, openers as more of a psychological link or a psychological bridge between the hard work you have done and the hard work you have to do because you can lose touch with what it feels like to hurt real bad. And it kind of ties back to that whole phenomenon of having a really good Sunday race after a really hard Saturday race. I mean, physiologically, that doesn't stand up at all. You should be tired. You should have a worse Sunday day, but you spend all of Saturday familiarizing yourself with what it feels like to hurt. Then you come into Sunday, basically cognizant of all of that and I, it, things just go better. So it's kind of along the same 
same lines of logic. Remember what it feels like to hurt. Never get too far away from it when you need to be sharp. That's awesome. I can't say anything better than that on that one. Okay, Kevin's question. He says, I'm wondering why building muscle with weightlifting to increase body weight helps with endurance. That seems total, ca totally counterproductive, right? We're kind of bookending this one talking about, <clears throat> you know, body types, weight, all that stuff. He says, I know quite a bit of rowers who weightlifted and gained weight and then improved their endurance power. What doesn't make sense to me is that I thought they would be building type two fibers when they gain muscle mass. And I wouldn't think those type two fibers would help at all when it comes to endurance. Great question. Right, Chad? Okay. Yep. So let me rephrase it, Kevin. You're basically asking how can hypertrophy further endurance capabilities? Seems like the two run counter to one another, right? What's hypertrophy? Um, we should probably so define hypertrophy that. Hypertrophy is just bigger muscle fibers. So same muscle fiber just gets bigger. That's it. So bigger muscles. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this to 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we, we want to do some live questions and you can do it, Chad, the three amigos. We can do all of it. Yeah. Okay. So, but this is a really, it's a hot topic for me. Always has been strength training and, and, and strength training's influence on whether it's negative or positive on endurance performance. I honestly can't get enough of this stuff. So there are two ways to get stronger. You can either increase your muscle mass or what's termed typically measured as cross-sectional area. So just bigger fibers, and this is hypertrophy, or you can go about it via neural, neural adaptations. So how the brain communicates with the muscle, how the muscles work nervously. So let's first look at strength without changes in body mass, because us as endurance athletes, that's pretty much what we're seeking. It's not really what the question's about, but let, let's cover both sides of this. Uh, there, there are a couple of ways to improve strength without really influencing your body mass. Uh, one of them is explosive strength. This is also referred to as low force, high volume, or I'm sorry, velocity. I'm going to make that mistake. I, I, I even changed the, the abbreviation so I wouldn't. So low force, high velocity. So you're not moving a lot of weight, but you're moving it really rapidly. And, and, and the rep range, or I'm sorry, the, the loading typically falls on the low end of things. So 30 to 60% of what you can move one time. So your one RM, your one repetition max. Examples of this would be three sets of 20 jump squats or a couple 30 rep sets of, uh, of a split squat um, per, per leg. A body weight version of this would be jumping rope. Something as, as simple as jumping rope, even jumping jacks qualify as plyometrics. I mean, it's the same thing. It's high velocity with, with a low load. Um, another way to do it is with heavy strength. So now we're talking the other end of that. So now it's high force, low velocity. So you're not moving it fast, but you're moving a ton of weight. And now we shift to the other end of, of the loading range all the way up to hundred percent. So let's say 80 to hundred percent is typically where this is set. So think of three sets uh, of an exercise done one to five times. If you're working at your one RM, you're going to do it one time. If you can do it more, it's not your one RM. So the idea here is <laughs> exactly super science. Chad, right <laughs> Chad dropping bombs. Sorry, Chad. Yeah. Oh. So, so we're, we're in, with heavy strength training, we're trying to improve a lot of things and a lot of these things carry over to endurance performance. So one thing that you do improve or will improve if you do it right is peak force. And this is another one of those tides that lifts all ships. So you, this can be reduced to your one second max torque. So if you go all out for five or six seconds, what, what did your best one second yield? And let's take, for example, someone who can do 600 watts for a second versus someone who can do 1200 watts for a second. Both of them want a 300 watt FTP. Is it realistic for someone to be able to operate at 50% of their maximum torque for the better part of an hour? Not so much, but you take that 600 watt one second power, grow it to 1200 watts over however long, whatever. For the sake of this discussion, we're gonna double it now that 300 watt FTP goal is 25% of your maximum one second torque, far more realistic. So mm -hmm. basically you're increasing your ability to produce force in increasing your ability to produce force increases your opportunity to lift your sustainable power. You got to push that ceiling way up. Otherwise you have to operate too close to the ceiling and it's just, it's just not tenable. It's not, it's not going to happen. And then metabolically, you're only ever able to operate at so high a percentage of your peak power capability. Again, you can't stay at 50% of your maximum for a long period of time. 25%? Absolutely. Another thing we're trying to improve with heavy strength, that, that high force, low velocity is uh, it's, it's a mouthful, but it's your max voluntary isometric contraction. And if you think of moving against an immovable force or, or not moving, <laughs> contracting against an, an immovable force. So as much force as you can exert, but nothing goes anywhere, 
that's an isometric contraction that's maximum and it's voluntary and and what this does is it reduces the number of motor units that are necessary to produce a certain amount of force so this many muscles muscle fibers had to fire but through practice through increasing increasing this isometric force capability less muscle fibers are recruited to do the same job you can also improve your rate of force or the, the heavy strength work improves your rate of force development your rfd and this is this basically changes or reduces the time to reach your peak force you get there quicker you recruit faster it also increases increases your muscle perfusion so it increases how rapidly you can perfuse the muscle with blood and all the things it brings with it, it can also improve your musculotendinous stiffness musculotendinous stiffness. And this may not seem like it applies to cycling, but it absolutely does. I mean, it definitely applies more to running, but when we can employ any aspect of the elastic nature of our muscles to further our power on the bike, why wouldn't we? It's free power. It's free muscle contraction, basically. And then we're, we, we can also increase our economy or our efficiency. These two terms get interchanged enough but for, for this argument they, they can be the same thing and and we improve this this movement economy or this efficiency in a number of ways one of them is to increase what's termed the agonist activation so the prime mover the, when it comes to the pedal stroke the quads extend the knee so we can improve how how well that activates we can increase the synergistic activation so all the muscles that facilitate or, or help the quad extend the knee the quads extend the knee so that's the synergistic side of things. We can decrease the antagonistic sorry, act, activation. And this is termed reciprocal inhibition. So if you think of, again, the quads are trying to extend the knee to drive the pedal down. The hamstrings want to flex the knee to not necessarily bring it back up, but just the, the other side of how that, that joint a, uh, actuates. And if they're active, while one muscle is doing one thing, the other muscle is countering that muscle's job so the idea here is being really quite simply muscle coordination. We want certain muscles to turn off while certain muscles are turned on. We want the muscles to support the muscles that are turning on to turn on. Basically, we want, to, we want to improve our muscular coordination. And a really simple example of this is climbing out of the saddle. So in terms of efficiency, how, how wasteful are you? What's the oxygen cost when you're all over the bike trying mm -hmm. to put out the same number of watts where if you do it in a more coordinated manner, you bring the, the movement economy up, your lack of coordination improves, you use less oxygen, you are more efficient. Mm -hmm. And then from the economy perspective, it, it's something that remains high late into long rides. I think this is something a lot of people don't recognize, but if at the end of a you know three or four hour ride, you're still running reasonably efficiently, you have lower blood lactate levels, lower heart rate levels, this this is a boom to performance and 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 it's something that is is tough to convey by just going out and doing long miles strength training does a much better job at it mm. and the, the, this high force low velocity training can actually lead to greater contractile strength in contractile strength in your type 1 fibers so your slow twitch fibers can incur maximal strength gains. You can actually make your slow twitch fibers bigger. This carries. They have to be loaded differently. They have to be challenged differently, but those fibers can get bigger. So you can strengthen your endurance, as, as paradoxical as that sounds. <laughs> and this leads to what? Greater average power over long distance events. So if you can bring your average power up even five watts over the course of many minutes, many hours, it, it, it has an impact. This high force, low velocity training, so strength, heavy strength work, can also increase your, your phosphocreatine storage, your, your glycogen storage, in the, the, those capacities in your type two fibers. So your type two A and your type two B fibers. So we're, we're basically loading these things up more and more and we're doing it through strength training of all things. Um, one of the geez, f formative studies by Hickson, and, and that's a good name to look up if this is of any interest to you at all, looked at high force, low velocity training and they marked or measured a 30% increase in, in one RM. I think it was a squat, but I can't remember off the top of my head. And they did it without any increase in cross-sectional area. Thighs didn't get any bigger, but they went up 30% in strength. I mean, who wouldn't want that? You're stronger so, and you don't even weigh more. That's like the biggest uh, fear <clears throat> that's completely yeah. irrational is like, as soon as yeah, I touch we'll weights, to I'm just gonna get huge, right? And, and yeah. that's, that's irrational. Yeah. So, so now let's get a little more back to, to the question at hand and, and talk about strength with the potential, and let's say potential, for additional mass. So increases in cross-sectional area ties directly to your increase in your peak power output and your time trial performance. Study after study, 
validates this. There's, there's, there's a lot of evidence to support it. Bigger fibers can do more work. Bigger muscles can do more work, but bigger fibers don't necessarily mean more body mass and weight, body mass and weight. And that's why I said there's a potential for it. If you look at a, a study Ronestad did back in 2010, showed an increase in cross-sectional area. So, so bigger fibers, but no body mass change, which is quite simple. You know, they, they, they swapped fat for muscle. So, so body composition shifted and, and they got stronger. Now they got more muscle, but they got less fat. So their body weight didn't change at all. And this is yet another vote of confidence in, in, in favor of strength training as one of the many things it is an excellent fat burner. Mm. And then what about the mass in the non-driving muscles? So you're adding mass and they're not even the muscles that power the pedal stroke. Well, they do other things. They stabilize the torso. They help you improve your power transfer. That goes back to that movement economy we just talked about. And a perfect example of this is someone like Stefan Kuhn. I mean, watch that guy ride a bike. He is putting out big watts. You know he is by the time he puts in for the size he is and the lack of aero. I mean, he's pretty aero, but he's a big guy. And he, he looks gorgeous. I mean, he's, he's just... He, he rides that bike perfectly. There is not a bit of waste in that entire system. Mm -hmm. And and here the movement economy is due to less wasted movement, less movement requires less oxygen, boom, greater efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> this is the, that's like a, if you're searching for the sort of gains and everything else that you're, that you're trying to move or trying to get, that's probably one of the easiest grabs right there. It's an efficiency mm -hmm. grab. That's absolutely within everybody's grasp. Yep. And then a couple of things I'll talk super quickly about because these are big topics and we're not going to cover them today, but is uh, anaerobic power contributes to endurance too. You stay below 70% and you think, well, I'm not even using any of my type two fibers, but you actually are. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there's still some anaerobic and, and glucose utilization going on, even at low workloads and anaerobic fibers aren't entirely anaerobic you know, predominant is the word that's always used here because they're predominantly anaerobic, but your anaerobic fibers can contribute to highly aerobic work levels. They're still in play. So it's not really the worst thing to have plumper, you know, type two fibers, those, those, those medium twitch and those fast twitch fibers, especially when it comes to those <laughs> situations in a race where you need power, mm -hmm. you can't just rely on endurance. You need to be able to push out some big Watts for, for short periods of time. And then just a couple bits of encouragement to strength train. There's evidence that supports benefits across all levels of cyclists, all the way from off the couch to recreational, well, not off the couch, but recreational all the way up to world tour level. Mm -hmm. Strength training works and it works for everybody. Has to be you know, done right, of course. But, and then if you just look past the, the performance impacts, it reduces injury. And anytime you reduce injury, not only are you not incurring injuries and having to go through that entire process, but fewer training interruptions. Mm -hmm. And the more consistently you can train, the quicker you get faster. And then finally, I want to put to bed some of the, I'm going to bulk up fears because first and foremost, adding mass is hard. It's hard for everyone. Even dedicated strength athletes struggle to add mass. There's a tipping point beyond which it is so hard to add. And the initial gains that you see when you start weightlifting, especially as an endurance athlete who isn't doing endurance training and decides to take up strength training for a brief period of time is you get this rapid response. And you think, oh my God, I'm going to get huge. <laughs> Give it time. That's all going to come back off. It, 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 again, we're, we're, we're constantly providing ourselves with signals that fly counter to strength objectives. We can't have it all. So, and then, and then supplementary training by endurance athletes. Do you think that piling more work onto an already endurance loaded body is going to yield bigger muscles? I mean, that again, this is counter to everything. This is counter to how the body works. The body doesn't conserve when we're asking it to work all the time. It, it works. Mm. Um, the increases in cross sectional area. So the, so the, the bigger muscle fibers are blunted again, no, no shortage of research on this matter by concurrent training. Anytime you add, and this is basically what I was just talking about endurance training or add strength training to endurance training. It, it's just, it, it runs counter to it. And then finally, most ectomorphic somatotypes to, to bring this all full circle will forever struggle to get big. I mean, yes, you can, you can modify your diet and, and increase your protein intake and frequency, and you can do high volume strength training, and you could even do anabolic steroids if your goal is simply to add muscle mass, <laughs> but the likelihood of any of these things taking place in an endurance athlete is so, so, so slim. I mean, we are endurance athletes by and large. It, it, it'd be so hard for us to maintain a high level of endurance and add a high level of body mass. Yeah. 
yeah, it just doesn't really work like that, right? So I know uh, for Keegan, he's, uh, once again, go ahead and drink if you're playing that game. <clears throat> but he uh, he said that that's one of the biggest differences that's that he has made in his training to elevate him to the point where he's, you know, best in the nation and, and you know, getting to the point where hopefully he can knock on the door of some, some good World Cup finishes here. Um, yeah, that's, that's how I spent the early part of my uh, personal training career. I mean, basically, the, the thing that led to all of this was – rebuilding ruined endurance athletes, people who were injured all the time. And, mm. and it wasn't that hard. I mean, they just needed to address some pretty simple, straightforward things. And, and I, in fact, rebuilt them. They, they became athletes who weren't injured as often, who could improve because they weren't constantly hobbled by some nagging issue. Yep, absolutely. Okay, some live questions. <clears throat> Forgive me. First one's from Anthony. He says, just started base training for the winter. It feels so easy. I always get the feeling I should be working harder. Do I bump up the effort or trust the process? Been a member for a year and a half. What do you say, Pete? I I just relish in that feeling. <laughs> I know. Lo I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and I think, uh, yes, it should. Um, relatively speaking. Um, and you can always add a little, you can add a little extra if it's still feeling easy, but definitely stay the course for a little while, see how it feels in a couple of weeks, in a month, in your next phase, and then you can make a new call. But man, mm -hmm. it's going to be, yeah, enjoy it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, if you don't, if you don't have a lot of experience at, in, in, with endurance training or structured endurance training, I say trust the process until you figure out what about the process might not be working for you, but initially you have to just kind of trust it. Yeah. And also, I mean, one thing you can do if you do have experience in that sort of stuff, you know, try upping your FTP by 3% and see how that feels. And it might be substantially different or take a ramp test. Um, and you'll be able to see if you haven't taken one recently, that said, if you have settle in, don't worry. And you will think back on these days with great fondness at some point <clears throat> when you're in the middle of a build plan and, and, and really hurting. Okay. Uh, next one says, what's the best way to understand composition of one's diet? My fitness pal app feel like he says, I feel a little like a rabbit in the headlights and need something to, to help with the star to start this journey of measuring and improving my diet. What would you say, Pete? <clears throat> yeah. A scale and a, and my fitness pal is a pretty easy way to those are the two tools you need. Um, I don't even really like measuring cups and uh, that you just get, things get pretty loose really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So scale, uh, just get a coffee scale and you're fine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my fitness pal. And then, and try not to judge yourself too harshly when you're figuring things out, just measure and don't, don't do any, don't do any changes. Don't do any consultations or anything. Just measure for a week and that's it. Do mm -hmm. your normal stuff. You don't need the premium my fitness pal by the way you can just do the free yep. one and that'll allow you to measure because that's honestly the be biggest benefit that you'll get is just that awareness right pete so mm -hmm. absolutely okay uh, another one uh, having had months of consistent training going from 278 watts to 318 watts since march way to go by the way mm -hmm. uh, i got knocked for six uh for six i assume Knock for six. Okay. It's a UK expression. I have no clue what I'm saying here. And I could be being Bart Simpson. <laughs> I apologize. He says by a virus, he says it was not COVID-19 and it's meant 12 days off. How do I start my training again? Chad, if you and I had a buck for each time, somebody asked, how do I restart my training mm. after an illness? Eh? Um, yeah. but yeah, what would you suggest coming back from illness? Uh, just take it slow. Uh, the advice we've offered many times is when you feel ready to get back on the bike, give it a couple more days it, it, as bummer as that is to think I've already missed 12 days. Now it's going to be 14. Those additional two days will do you more good than harm. Mm, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and then he's back into it. I mean, obviously you're not going to jump back into the high intensity end of the pool. So, so just kind of get a feel for how your body is responding to the lower intensity stuff before you start to add that high intensity stuff back in and be okay with taking a few steps forward, then taking a step back if you need to as well. Just understand that yeah. even if we feel okay, it sometimes it takes a lot of time. Uh, to come back for our body, it, even from a simple cold, as we call it, it might not be that simple to our body. So <laughs> even though we, we say it is so, uh, okay. Uh, next one, it, this one says at some point on a future TR podcast, can the team touch on working around asthma, how to train around it and how to deal with stigmas and cycling surrounding it? Yeah. It would be an interesting one to cover for sure. Um, a good topic. Yeah. 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 We can, we'll put it on the docket. Hey, Chad. <laughs> yeah. 
Ooh, next one's from Noah. Noah Sears from Mountain Racing Products MRP. <clears throat> he says, how do I beat Nate today? He says, and he's talking about the opening stage. So for those that don't know, Nate is doing a socially distanced and safe race. Um, it's called the Pikes Peak Apex, and it's a four-day mountain bike stage race, and he's doing it to prepare to prepare for Cape Epic. And it's in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Like even packet pickup is in your vehicle, for example. It's like the riders meeting was over Zoom. They're doing a lot of cool things to be able to to keep it safe and try to maintain that for, for the event. But Noah has been training with Trainer Road. I know that much. And he's been getting faster. And then Nate is also really fast right now. So I think that Nate's probably somewhere around 360 maybe again with FTP. Like he's, he's pretty up there. So uh, – I don't know. How would you say to beat Nate in a prologue that has some climbing, but also some descending in it? What would you say, Pete? Go fast on the descent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nate, if Nate's watching this or listening to this right now, yeah, this is our opportunity. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I would say, uh, yeah, just go fast. I bet, I bet if you goes, I bet if Noah goes as hard as he can, it'll be a good battle, but maybe Noah will come out on top. This will be a really good battle to watch between these two, I think, because Noah's fast in terms of fitness, but he's extremely fast on downhills because of being an ex-pro downhiller, right? Uh, and then, but Nate is really fit right now, like really fit. Um, and he's gotten a lot better at descending too. So uh, in fact, he just went to a clinic and I think that he was actually like, uh, I think he dropped the instructor or something. So um, on a descent. So he's, he's getting, he's, he's right. getting really good at it. This will be great. This is like, we should fantasy this race, right? Um, uh, uh, we have, we have one question about cold and breathing techniques and stuff. We're going to not touch that one at all right now. Um, maybe we'll touch it in a future podcast. It hasn't been asked before, but, uh, that's a, that's a rabbit hole and a half, uh, to get into with a whole a lot of too. conflicting stuff too, that, that surrounds it. So Okay. This last one, this is from Felix. He says, do you have any book recommendations? I just finished Alex Hutch, Alex Hutchinson's Endure, which was great. And he says, also he's Canadian. <laughs> yep. <laughs> he says, I've got two volume camps coming up and need some good reads. Thanks. Mm. Um, do you have any that come off the top of your heads? Pete, you go. I'm, I'm booting up. Kendall. <laughs> I'm, I'm Googling too. Hold on. <laughs> uh, the sports gene was one that Chad recommended to me. Oh and yeah. That's a very was good me. read. That was one sure. that I, he's, he's got a, he has a newer book too. Yeah. Um, I, I, lately I've been into autobiographies and, and, and man, there's some interesting stuff out there. Currently it's uh wheelman written mm. by uh, Reed Abergati. So if you want to go deep into the doping culture of the, you know, late nineties, early two thousands and you know, well into the two thousands, fascinating read. I highly recommend mm. that one. Yep an easy read that goes by like really quick. Um, and it's one that I find very enjoyable, uh, because he is an extremely good writer. Also a fantastic Twitter follow a different Hutchinson, Michael Hutchinson. Uh, he has a book called faster, the obsession, science and luck behind the world's fastest cyclist. And he does a fantastic job of separating the objective from the subjective. And also like it's, he makes it a great read. There's plenty of self deprecating humor within there as well, where he talks about himself as kind of an experimental mm. lab rat. Uh, but he's very qualified, of course, to speak on the things that he does as well. So, um, and, and he's written a number of different books, anything from Michael Hutchinson, I find very, very interesting and entertaining. Agreed. And, and we said, we're not going to cover the, the Wim Hof question, but the author of the book that addressed that is Scott Carney. And he has a newer book out called the wedge, which mm -hmm. is more the psychological side of things. Very interesting. That's it's absolutely worth a read. Yep. Um, the other two, uh, two books by Matt Fitzgerald, how bad do you want it? And the endurance diet, both of those are fantastic books. Uh, how bad do you want it? will have you being very present in the training and racing process and being able to view things from a different perspective. And the endurance diet will give you very objective and clear things that you can guidelines, uh, kind of like guardrails, I guess that you can use. That'll give you plenty of latitude to be able to explore and adjust and kind of, uh, live what you need to live. But at the same time give you clear direction on how you can improve your diet for endurance performance. Do you have any others, uh, to add Pete or Chad? <laughs> you got, you did a good job, John. Those are the couple I was thinking of too. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, the sports gene is really good. The sports gene is an easy, fun read too. If you mm. need something to uh, stoke your fires late at night, yeah, it's good. Um, Ooh, I have I have two others that have really helped. Um, so, number one, "Eat, Race, Win" by uh, Hannah Grant. I should say three others, and then she also has the Grand Tour Cookbook, which I actually just recently bought and I'm excited to get. I haven't gotten it yet. We want to have her on the podcast, by the way. So, and and we're working on that, which would be great. Uh, if anybody doesn't know, Hannah was, uh, she's was, has been, and will be a chef for various <laughs> pro tour teams, and she does an incredible job. And she also, like, if you see any of the content she's created or anything else or any of the books that she's written, fantastic job of relaying this stuff in a practical way. Um, and, and then also and her this, recipes, her recipes yes. are also very good. Yes, and the Scratch Labs cookbooks, I love those. They're really good. Mm. Um, not just the portables one, but they also have like meal um, uh, dishes that you can get. And when we talk about high quality, it will force you out of your comfort zone probably in a lot of ways to get different ingredients and go down that aisle or that little produce section that you never really go to at the grocery store and make some things that you didn't know you liked. And now they'll become things that you can rely on. So. Okay, I've got one last one. Cool. It's uh, the author is Sayer G. And it's probably not pronounced G, but it's J-I. Uh, it's called regenerate and it's uh mm. it's a little off the, a little off topic but not exactly because anything that makes our bodies healthier makes us stronger athletes so i highly recommend that because the the guy is self-deprecating as jonathan just mentioned with hutchinson but extremely well written i mean even mm. if you, the topic matter isn't interesting to you the, the way this guy writes is uh just the best so very good awesome Cool. Well, with that, that was a super, I feel like we have some great actionable takeaways for all of you, whether it's on ignoring your body type that, that you tend to see and instead chasing performance and going for that, uh, plenty of stuff about breakaways, descending, even book recommendations. So hopefully it was a really good episode for everybody. If you're watching this right now on YouTube, give it a thumbs up. That will make sure that more people find this and more cyclists will be able to get faster. And please head over to trainerroad.com and send your friends. If we could give you a homework assignment, even though of course we wouldn't do such a thing, but if we could, we would totally ask you to send your friends to trainerroad.com so then they can get faster. It's the best way to help this podcast. And we'll talk to you all next week. Thanks everybody. Bye everybody. Thank you. See you guys.